What's going on, everybody? Cali Death Podcast back once again, another Thursday. Here we are in your living room, bedroom, wherever the fuck you are watching this. We are with you now. Episode 33. I'm super excited about this. I'm with my usual resident homies, Casey, Joel, and Joseph. And we got a very special guest, Dallas from Narcotic Wasteland and Nile fame. What's going on, Dallas? How are you doing? Doing well, yeah, bro. I know we just been. I know it's funny. I'm saying what's going on, even though we've been already been talking for 15 minutes or so. But <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. What's I'm going on for the other people? <laughs> <laughs> what's up? Good. Yeah, Start dude. To have you this here, man. Is, yeah, thank you so much again for giving us a chunk of your time, dude. It's a, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you on. You know, it's it with this podcast. It's it's so cool with how many different people we've already been talking to, and and I, you know at 15 years old when I was getting really into metal, you guys were, Nile was one of the first shows that I went to at the great American music hall, probably the first show at great American music hall. You were on the cradle of filth, Nile, God forbid tour. And wow. that was just one of those mind blowing shows for me. So this is super exciting, dude. I want to get into everything. I want to get into narcotic wasteland. I want to get into some past stuff. Um, yeah, dude, everybody, all the subscribers, thank you so much for being with us again. And uh, I hope you like the live stuff. We're going to be doing those more. Um, what else we got? We got, uh, you got anything you want to plug real quick, Dal Dallas? You got a, a page that everybody wants to go to for Narcotic Wasteland merch or news or anything like that? Uh, basically, just NarcoticWasteland.com or, uh, you know, uh, Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Sweet. You know, the yeah. usual suspects. <laughs> Yeah, just Google the name and you'll find it. The new record is pretty fucking, much. The pretty new record much. is so awesome. I listened to it on the way here to the studio today, and I love it. It's so fucking good, man. It's a really good, album, a really good album. Absolutely. Yeah, sick. I I got stuck in traffic today, going from one job location to the next, and I blasted it the whole time. I was in bumper to bumper traffic, but I was just like, "This is chill." It. It's fucking <laughs> so good. Yeah, your Makes voice is so easier. your voice is so like memorable. Like it brings back yeah. like childhood shit you know yeah. for me like yeah. hearing your voice because like that was always my favorite you were always my favorite part of nile and that was like just your aggression and your i don't know your your fucking face that you make and everything man you just had that like energy that pissed off energy and talking to you now that's what i love about death metal so much is like how mellow and nice and chill you are <laughs> and then yeah, on stage dude. you're just like you let it loose man just as a different animal comes out i love it <laughs> you gotta save that shit up <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> so, so dallas Thank how you. we how we usually do this is uh we go back in time you know we want to go back to uh your your adolescence whenever whenever music became important whenever you decided to pick up an instrument and start getting serious about learning it like we want to know that's like the seed of it all and then you just let it go and we'll 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 go with you bro all right <laughs> well i guess uh if we talk about the beginning um, I got an interest in drums when I was probably, I don't know, maybe about eight or nine years old. And I had an uh, older cousin that was a musician and playing in bands. He, uh, he played bass and keyboards and sang. And I think he ended up going to like music college or whatever, but, uh, they, they played in a band. And, uh, when they were not practicing or whatever, I sat behind the drum set and Next thing you know, I'm fabricating my own drum set out of pots and pans and lids nice. and all kinds of stuff. And have and you ever heard of, real quick? Sorry to cut you off. Have you ever heard of a band called Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum? Nope. <laughs> they were made. They, the, there's a drummer in the band that literally is just the same way. He has he, all of his stuff is found percussion instruments. So it's like a a a sink and a fucking bell, <laughs> like a. A, a saw and like other things that you would find at a junkyard so that just clicked in my mind when you're saying getting pots and pans together and shit yeah i mean it would be you'd be amazed at uh what can actually be a, a valid percussive instrument i mean if you're a drummer and you know i ended up you know that was my thing i was going to be a drummer um i but to just quickly fast forward and kind of get back into what you were saying, uh, I uh, practiced my drums a lot and then I eventually ended up getting a small little kind of like Sears kit or something that I completely destroyed and then finally got my first drum set. And uh, 
I practiced my ass off and, you know, I, I was hanging out with dudes that were 10 years older than me and they were turning me on to shit like Rush and, you know, of course, like I was already into Black Sabbath and stuff like that, but, you know, Deep Purple and all, all the shit. If you don't mind and, me asking, what year is this, Steve? Uh, this is going to be like 1983, 1984. Okay. The year I was born. Um, and uh, I played Tom Sawyer on the drums at my fourth grade talent show. Nice. 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 Um, and I did a pretty good job. Uh, there was one part that I always would play so loud I couldn't hear the record player. So um, I was afraid about that. But when I came out of that random thing before they go into the uh, the one of the verses again, before they go into the chorus, um, I was on when I came out of that. I was like, yes. So I just kept nice. going. And that was a, a small victory. And then uh, And then I still played drums and I played all kinds of different stuff. And then started getting into more of the heavier shit like metal church. And of course, you know, usual suspects, Metallica, Megadeth, who was, Slayer, feed, who was feeding Anthrax, you, at the time? you know, who huh? was feeding, who was feeding you that at the time? Are we discovering it on your own? Uh, a little bit of both, uh, you know, hanging out with kids at school or, you know, hanging out with my older cousin and shit and, or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. and we're always kind of getting into that. And that's what, uh, I, I had guitar around anyways. Uh, my grandfather played guitar. Uh, I knew how to tune one. He showed me how to tune one before I knew how to play anything on it, but I didn't really take it seriously. Um, and then fast forwarding, when I started getting to the heavier stuff, uh, I uh, jammed with a couple of dudes from school or whatever. And uh, and I was like, man, how are you making that sound? And he showed me it was a, you know, basically a power chord. And uh, I pretty much took it from there. Yeah, and that just that that one chord changed my fucking life. Isn't that crazy? But no, it's not. It's <laughs> and, not. And, and, I mean, you hear that? You hear that one time where you you made you made a noise that other people make that you like hearing that noise, and you're like, oh, I can do it too. You know, even if it is just a power chord. You know, it's like that. That you can was move nice. it around, man. You can move that thing around and just keep it going, like punk rock or whatever and stuff. Just move it, and you have a punk song. You know. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, my very rudimentary, basic uh, understanding of anything on guitar was, you know, just the basic chords, but I never did anything with it. You know, like G, C, D and F. Um, I didn't really I could do it, but I just didn't ever really screw with it. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, then I started hearing that and I was like, oh, OK. And then once I figured out how to put my hand on the bridge the right way, I was like, Oh, now we're in business. Yeah. And uh and then, you know, uh um, took a little bit of music theory in high school and then uh and then the rest is fucking history and, and until recently where last year I took some lessons. So, you you said you started as a drummer and then you picked up the guitar were you just playing those both simultaneously as much as you could once you once- uh yeah, once the uh, once I started getting more serious in the guitar, the drums collected dust, and then I didn't really play unless I was over at a party or something. Uh, me and the lead guitar player in Narcotic, uh, Ed, uh, we used to go hang out at a friend's house, and he had a jam room, and you know, we would always go over there and have a couple of drinks and maybe smoke a little weed or something and just jam all night. Yeah, dude. And we, and we would switch off. Somebody play drums. Somebody would play guitar, and you just riff out. It was like That's exactly uh, how we were, dude. Like, like riffing a- improv, like on the spot type shit. You know, it was a lot of fun. I'm a vocalist, we, but I just couldn't working on our chops too. You know. Yeah, I just want to say vocalist. I, we, we, I just wanted let me. I just wanted to say that as a vocalist, all I wanted to do was sit down on the drums. So it's like as soon as the as soon as jamming was over for serious and everybody could fuck around, like Troy get up <laughs> or Casey get up please let me fucking sit down on that I, I just had to get it out for like 10 minutes dude even though I sucked it felt good <laughs> to beat on shit for like 10 minutes you know and then that. you get a blast beat and you're like wait oh shit I did that for like one second right like maybe I can get two seconds <laughs> <laughs> well I'll tell I you I what could- that's what inspired me that was singularly what inspired me to try to play drums again after not really messing with them for over 10 years. And that was when um, I bought a drum set in 2003. Uh, it was uh, the, I think the last 
American tour for In Their Dark and Shrines. Mm. And uh, I was like, well, you know, I've been saving, you know, and all that stuff. And I was like, oh, I got a little bit extra money. I'm going to buy a fucking pearl kit. I bought a double bass pearl kit, three racks, two floors, two bass drums. And I started practicing because uh, I think initially at that point, I was going to maybe try and just do an album where I did all the instruments. And then I uh, started jamming and then heard that a band in town called Lecherous Nocturne needed a uh, drummer. So I did that and then I was I was okay, but I think they were looking for somebody a little bit faster at the time. Like I hadn't really ever played drums like that. Yeah. Um, so it took me a minute to get up to speed, but then we ended up uh, playing a couple of shows and I ended up playing on the Adoration of the Blade record. Nice. Um, and it was a lot of fun and those guys are great. And actually I saw uh, Chris, the guitar player earlier today. Uh, and oh, uh, great guys, great talented band. You should definitely check them out. And we were just talking about how awesome it would be for uh, a band like us and them and uh, uh, say maybe Unmerciful or something go on tour together. <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude. Casey, Swamp I'm sorry. Right I, I really cut you off earlier, dude. I'm, I'm sorry. What were you about to say, Casey? Oh, dude, not at all, man. It's it's, did good. we pass it oh, up? No, I'm it's sorry. Fine. No, totally no, there's a lot that. of people here. It's a, all right, it cool. happens, man. <laughs> all right, I was cool. just excited because I was like, what I was going to say, I was like, dude. How sick would it be to, to have those old, if, like those like improv jam sessions? If we could like hear those from back in the day, like with with your band and like imagine hearing all the ones that we did all over the years. I know, we're, dude. We're talking about like when we were on, to or on tour with Cryptopsy one time and Matt and Flo were just jamming, you know. Yeah, it was like I wish insane. we could hear that, like an, dude. Like, like yeah. an album worthy jam. I was just sitting there just like, what the fuck? Have you guys been yeah. practicing? Like what's going yeah. on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about we the improv did, jams. We actually did record. Uh, I gotta find it. It's on a tape though, because I I used to have a little boombox tape player that would record. Had a pretty nice mic if you put it like in the room, covered mm -hmm. it with a towel or some shit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> there's some jam sessions with Dan on bass, Dusty on guitar and vocals, and me on drums. And we're oh, like, you mix it around, yeah, shittily totally. That's trying to like cover songs <laughs> or do old severed songs that weren't even recorded. Dusty was like, "Oh, dude, I I remember." a severed song that never got recorded that's got pretty easy drums i think you could do it and i fucking slopped my way through it but it just felt good to be like i'm yeah. playing a song on drums right now fuck <laughs> all right enough about um yeah dallas i remember from back when i was like a super nile fan reading that you had actually demoed a little bit of or maybe some of the annihilation of the wicked songs on drums that got sent to george do you remember this if this is true oh uh, no that would actually not be true um uh, i'll okay. tell you what happened this is actually what happened i was we were working on annihilation and you know we had george in town and we were working on stuff and uh you know, of course, he obviously just knocked shit out of the park. We were like, all right, well, let's jam some songs and, and see what's up. And, of course, he was just ripping the shit out of everything. And we were happy as fuck. And, uh, but basically, when we were, um, you know, working on Annihilation, uh, the first song I think I was really working on that I had been working on for a little while was The Burning Pits of the Duot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I was going to do like what I would normally do, which is make like a demo with basic drum machine. Um, when you hear a fill from one of my demos on a drum machine, it's like, okay, that means insert fill here. It doesn't mean that's the fill. That's that just, want, yeah. I think that's where a fill should go. You know, it's mm -hmm. suggestive. Mm -hmm. I have suggested drum programming. Well, in the process of that, I, um, I fried my drum machine <laughs> Like it literally smoked. <laughs> um, so at that point, that one was probably done the old fashioned way in the room. And then uh, for last of the slave stick, uh, I had um, just everything kind of to a click, but I had uh, a few, just only a few specific drum ideas in my head. Uh, one of them being that I wanted double bass through the entire song. And the second one was just a sort of uh, a sort of a swing beat where the bass drums are going, but the snare drum is almost polyrhythmic. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is actually very reflective of some shit that I was doing in like 95. But that was really it. Um, 
I wasn't, I can't play that shit on the drums. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And burning I, pits of a duo is like, I think it's one of the fat, one of the fastest songs on that record. It's probably up there with like cast down the heretic. Uh, I think the fastest song on that record is probably Sebek. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, and there's no fucking way, man. <laughs> I I thought it might be like a uh, like a Dave Suzuki type situation when you were if you were like also that shredding at drums, but um, but I, I guess I I my, what I might have heard is just that George came and played on your drum set or something. Um, um yeah, now we did use my drum kit when he came into town, uh, the one that I bought, and uh, it actually ended up being on Annihilation of the Wicked. And uh, yeah, it's a, just a killer. It's just a, a pearl export kit, and it's actually birch ply, so it's not a bad sounding kit. And actually, uh, the uh, uh, Joseph, the guy that's jamming with us now, he's been playing my kit, and he fucking loves it. Same yeah. kit, same yeah. one. Nice. Yep, yeah, same kit. Uh, it's you know, it's got some battle scars and stuff, but it sounds great. And, you know, uh, with a fresh set of heads on there, I, I really like Emperor Clears myself with a little bit of moon jail or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think that's like, they've got the most attack and they're, they're ballsy. They, they're, they're beefy sounding drums they are not thin. What's the make again? Pearl. It's just a Pearl export. Oh, kit. Pearl export. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Cool, dude. All right. We just jumped ahead way crazy, but <laughs> so let's get back to uh, where we were. I, you were talking about uh German. Uh, I'm sorry. Pronounce the band again for me. Let's oh, just like- not turn lecturous nocturne so you were you did a uh you ended up on one of their records and then where do you go from there uh well they you know they needed i was already in nile at that point um oh okay so that was even further in okay. i jumped ahead because uh, we got to good. talking about <laughs> drums or whatever totally yeah. but uh basically um you know to get back to you know the beginning um you know, I got better and better at guitar and then found a drummer and started my first band and all that. And, you know, we did a little bit of our stuff and we did a little bit of cover stuff and whatever. And then, uh, and I just kept, uh, you know, jamming with uh, different musicians in the area and, and then came across, uh, you know, uh, me and, uh, Ed Rohn met, which Ed is, uh, the lead guitar player in Narcotic Wasteland. Mm-hmm. Um, known the guy a long time, but you know, we, we played in bands a lot back then. And that was probably from like 1990 up to about 95. And then it just kind of dried up in the area. Nobody was really wanting to do that. There was nowhere to play, mm-hmm. uh, and all that stuff. And then, um, a buddy of mine that was stationed in the military that was, uh, in, in the area that, I had jammed with, you know, had had uh, gotten out of the military and moved back here to Greenville, South Carolina. I'm originally from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Mm. And uh, so he moves, he moved back here and uh, he was still you know, calling me every now and then. And, you know, there was a little bit of tape trading and stuff going on. And uh, I was like, man, you know, this is just really dead here and there's nobody jamming. And, uh, and there was a couple of bands to try out for. And one of those bands was mine. And uh, I tried out and got the gig and, you know, uh, then moved here. And then uh, we were still just a regional band at that point. I, and I didn't care. I just wanted to get the hell out of my dead ass town and do something different, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, there there you go now you can take it all the way to 2017 you know that was what i did from that point in uh september of 1997 to september of 2017 so yeah. uh my uh, my question actually is- take that back sorry 2016 i'm wrong about that it's 2016 wow. So when so you 19 years when you join nile is he wow. does he hand you like uh 10 uh, uh, encyclopedia sized books on Egypt. And he just says like, read all of this <laughs> or watch what's no, that ancient, no. <laughs> the no, fucking ancient like that. Egypt documentaries on history channel from this year to this year. Yeah. I, I mean, no, it wasn't like that at all. It was mostly about guitar and the music and stuff. Uh, yeah. 
And um, I had read, that was one of the things that kind of interested me about it. I had read a little bit. Uh, one of my earlier bands was called Deucalion, which is the son of Prometheus and it's Greek mythology and blah, 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 blah. And we didn't know what the fuck we were talking about, but it was fun. And, uh, and then um, along that path of just stuff like that, uh, I had read some, you know, stuff about Egypt or whatever. And I, I thought it was interesting and pretty cool take on things. Um, totally. Very, very but, unique uh, take in death metal at that time. Probably there's only a few other bands that were really diving in on that. And and when I say that, that I was just making a joke. I really enjoy, you know, studying ancient civilizations and stuff like that. So that's one of the key things that made Nile like link with me was this was this Egyptian full on like the, this is what these guys are about. So I was like, yes, I'm all in. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways that um, even if you're talking about something completely different in the song, it's a beautiful way to uh, express that. Mm -hmm. um, and so many times history repeats itself in uh, big, super monumental, epic ways or in a very small personal way. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are cool ways to kind of describe those sort of things. Yeah. Use it as a metaphor. I always love singing for... those lyrics too. The lyrics are always in themselves very expressive. Um, so yeah, yeah, really good stuff. And so Black Seeds was Black Seeds the first album you were on? Yeah, that was the first time I'd recorded with the band and um, you know contributed anything basically. And, so uh, pre pod, I was talking about the or I don't know, maybe it was on the pod, um, the Cradle of Filth tour. Um, mm -hmm. Was that the was that the supporting tour for that album or did, did it already come out before that uh it was one of them and i cannot personally remember because a lot of the time the way things are the way things are put together is that i uh, a lot of times back then you would be already on tour but the new album was coming out and it was going to come out either while you're on tour or right yeah. before the tour or right after the tour you Were know. you touring with them before Black Seeds? That's what you're saying. Yeah, oh, he was. Um, it may be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Did a lot of the Nefrica tours. Yeah. Um, I think actually pretty much all the Nefrica tours. Uh, they were probably playing some of that material. I know that they were doing a few uh, little excursions here and there regionally with like Incantation. Nice. And then we ended up doing a long. Uh, tour with incantation and uh that was really the first full-on one you know what i mean i think for that record and then that led to you know being able to have an opportunity to go tour with incantation and morbid angel yeah. and and then so we sick. just we were available to do it i mean and that's one of the things that a lot of people don't realize you've really got to set your life up and not give a shit to where you're actually available to go do this Yep. Yeah. And um, we were. And, and even if we weren't, we were. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Care. And make it happen. We didn't care. We wanted to do this. We believed in the band collectively. And that's how you do it. Totally. There was actually a tour opportunity for Odious with you guys. We got uh, beat out by Unexpect. There was a tour that Unexpect. Oh, with you guys. that was <laughs> yeah. uh, Immolation and Christian. Yeah. So yeah. it was up between Crazy. us and Unaccept, and they got the. They got the go ahead, and we Sons were like, "Guns, have yeah. fun." We, we well, really we, wish we were fucking on that shit. <laughs> I I wanted to say also that, like, like Catacombs was the first death metal CD that I ever bought. You know, mm -hmm. I was I was in oh, high wow. school. That's that's a, yeah. That's a, that you guys are the band that that got me into death metal. Like, oh wow! I'll I'll literally. I'll say that definitely. Casey always mentions yep. Nile and uh, and Hate Eternal. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it wasn't. But that was before I saw Hate Eternal. Then I was like, oh, like it was on the Conquering tour. It was like I was like, what's this? And I was like, you know. But uh, I had and Catacombs. David was way into it too. Yeah, like our friend and who who played in Odious with us. But I had the album, and I was like still in high school, and I I would play Super Metroid and like just listen to Nile. Like <laughs> Hell yeah. I just remember that. Like <laughs> those like levels at the bottom where it's like lava and it's like all like Egyptian and shit. Like Sick, I just like, dun, 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 dun. he planned just, it out. Oh, I know yeah, the uh, like, I know the song that you're talking about. Um, 
and it's in a couple of the Metroid games. And actually, my son, yeah, uh, would turn me on to the Metroid Metal and all that stuff. That was pretty cool. But uh, as an avid gamer for many years, I've always enjoyed um, various uh, video game soundtracks and da da da. Brimstone or whatever, yeah, and, uh, yeah, and yeah. totally. Uh, are you more into like the the old school like games? Like, cause you, are you still in the games nowadays? Yeah, uh, I like pretty much all of it. I don't, you know, of course, I have limited time to it, but uh, yeah, I have a pretty extensive collection of everything from NES on up into PS4. Uh, mm-hmm. I am, um, you know. I love just getting shot up at gun game on fucking Call of Duty too, but oh, I've, too, I've, I've won some matches and actually it was that's the one fucking uh, mode where you can shoot your friends. <laughs> oh, yeah, like yeah. we can't join, be a free for all together. I'm not gonna, yeah, cheat. Yeah, yeah. we're not gonna team up on everybody. No, you're my yeah. best friend. I want to shoot you because you're a fucking dick. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And you want to talk shit to your friends, you know? I hate that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so yeah. you can do gun game, and it's so fun to just, like stab your friend and be like, "Yes, fuck you." <laughs> uh, actually, recently, just because uh, I took a w- huge break from video games, but I, I mean, when I was touring, I would come home from tour, and my roommate had Call of Duty. That was like, I mean, back in the day, it was you know like at the NES, SNES, and Genesis, and all that stuff. I was way into it. Took a big break, got into StarCraft for a little while. Took another big break, and then got into um, the Call of Duty games because my roommates had it took a break from that now i'm back someone gave me a ps4 for like super cheap they're moving out of town and i'm playing that fucking warzone game like fucking two hours a day right now like i'm just like you know it's like 150 people just battle royale like on this humongous map and it just dude, keeps... i wonder how much you stare at a screen dude because you got to stare i know because i do it for work, work too i'm probably just gonna point. are you playing it on the same yeah. monitor too no it's on this monitor oh uh, okay so you just so, turn your head I think you right, should like dude. take take up kayaking or something, Joel. Yeah. No, I know, I know. I need to take up some form of exercise before these fucking man boobs get out of control. But uh, no, not just that. He's saying get out in nature, dude. I I, uh, I play Warzone. Um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. pretty fun. Uh, I I was playing H one Z one a lot. I've actually won a few times on that in solo battle nice. royale. I have not won in Call of Duty yet. I've only gotten second place. I've God, gotten second place three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On that's the solo tough. Ones. We have one now. Me, my roommate, and my best friend from high school. We were playing ba- uh, resurgence trios. Okay, and we won. We've won a nice. couple of times, and that's cool because it's a way smaller map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you you're just really diving right into the fucking action. You got to be able to shoot. I do so like, like Warzone. Do a little bit of. Well, I was gonna yeah, say I like got, a, like it totally like shrinks on you though, so you have to like you're gonna have to meet mm-hmm. up like you know. So well, that's like, like Fortnite. My uh, my oldest, he plays Fortnite. It's the same thing. It's if you're just they can because if they left it open, you guys would go forever. Ever. Somebody yeah, can yeah. hide in the bushes for three days. <laughs> Just like l- leave themselves in a dope ass bush and just be like, all right, dude, I'm going to cook lunch. I'm going to fucking, <laughs> you know, nobody's yeah, going to yeah, get yeah. them, you know? So they got to totally. be like, push those assholes into a smaller place to where they really have to fucking play, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great uh, game mode. Like I said, H1Z1, I played a shit ton of that and, uh, and uh, also Warzone, but I went ahead and bought uh, Modern Warfare so I can have your basic free for all do- yep. domination and team deathmatch and shit. Yep. I-, I really prefer free for all just simply because I always Me get too, stuck actually. with like the shittiest fucking team ever. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I- definitely. I'll be the best one on my team and I'm just getting fucking roasted. And I'm just like, man, really? <laughs> <laughs> is anybody going for these goals other than me? Like, I actually went from that. I went from the team deathmatch uh, free for all and was actually coming in first a bunch, like for in most kills. So then I was like, all right, I got to figure out this fucking warp zone thing. Like, I have the game. I just don't understand. I didn't understand it compared to like those game modes. So I was like, I don't even know what I, I guess it's a big map or something. And that's and then to take it, just like learn the slow way, just get your ass handed to you like multiple times to understand like what to actually do in that, you know, like. Well, yeah, it it has that similarity to say like a Rainbow Six type game where you really have to be patient. Yeah, and you can't just run out there like you're in fucking Quake Arena or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You can't yeah. do that. No, you have you have to kind of sneak around and be a little stealthy. 
You mm-hmm. don't want to be seen. You want to see them before they see you. That way you can get the drop on it. What's yeah. fucked up too is like uh, those, I, I found out that the PS4, the console people can play against, you're in the same match as the people with the computers and the mouse and keyboard. So those people can shoot Fuck way better because they can, they can hold the mouse down and yeah. like well, the recoil and point it down and just like, like shoot you so uh, specifically right at you and not like no recoil bumping up it's just like they just push it down so it just goes perfectly Com- at you compared to you aiming with your toggles and yeah yeah no, that's i think it's kind of fucked up <laughs> totally. well i've beat them so i can't say that <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. but there's it's some like, that uh, are on there that are so fucking good though that you're just like and there's a bunch of hackers that hack that game on computer and they have that auto aim thing and they hack it and they just go bam 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 and just take everyone out it's like Definitely the snipers. Um, yeah, but stay off the freaking rooftops. Move from building to building. Yeah, avoid yeah. open areas. But dude, in Warzone, I don't even like using vehicles because, well, I've just been blown up. It's like you always <laughs> get blown up, and I've even done it. There was two people shooting at me from a helicopter hovering over me, and I dipped out of the building and RPG that fucker and killed both of them. We were like, <laughs> <laughs> "Fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how popular that game is now though like i literally on facebook and stuff there's always like 10 live streams of like someone with like four thousand people watching it you know like watching these guys just play and like you know the guy from trivium has a huge following with warzone and and like all these like bands are starting to do it now too or like bands are on there live streaming and like getting don't try and get me to fucking it. do it dude don't I'm not. No, no. Do, this is my no. little secret hobby that I just told everyone. I know you're just. It's, it sounds like you're trying to get odious to get in on it, dude. <laughs> no, it takes too much time. I don't want to get you. Guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of those guys on them streams are pretty good. I, I've watched a couple. You know, just taking a dump, scrolling <laughs> through Facebook, be like, oh, okay, this will take up some time. Yep. And uh, and usually, yeah, there's some some pretty good players and. I'm just like, man, and they see those they've got that quick scope shit going on and they see stuff so quickly. I'm like, yeah, wow. Yeah. That's what gets me shot is I didn't see him up there and I didn't think to look up there. I just, just I got you, I got fucking sloppy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Or like you shoot at him for like one bullet and they know exactly where you are immediately, just like from behind. They're like, oh, he's up there, bam, and you're like dead. You're like, what the f- how do you even do that? <laughs> just like yeah. spending 10 hours. Those guys spend like eight hours a day playing that though so minimum mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. so i guess it's understandable That's so death the, uh, metal guys death metal so- <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no whatever <laughs> no i i was just i was trying to steer i mean I, I i like everything that you guys just said i was i don't really play the game i like video games i mean i never got into the online playing so that's like kind of when i fell out on it i would play yeah. I would play army games and shit like that, like Medal of Honor. I fucked around with back in the day, but yeah. What about uh, fucking? I already said it. Death metal, dude. <laughs> so <laughs> so you're back on from, course. You jumped to 2017. Um, so you said you're basically Narcotic Wasteland has people in it from your from the 90s, right? Or just one guy, or is it multiple people um, from back then? Actually, just uh, yes, and also um, you know. Uh, me and Ed have known each other a really long time, and uh, I met Chris, uh, our bass player. I met him for the first time in 2000 uh, mm-hmm. when I was in town visiting, and uh, we had talked on the phone a few times. And then, you know, fast forward a few years later, we talked on the phone a little bit again, and and uh, and then things just started happening. I started writing songs um that I just felt that was something kind of different, a little more old school and thrashy. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, decided to, and then I just kept doing it. And then next thing I know, I was like, you know, uh, and me and those dudes, you know, we, we stayed in touch, you know, over the years and sending back and forth music, you know, and stuff like that, that we had been working on. And uh, it just progressed from there. And, and then it was going to end up being like, it was going to be something that I would be doing when possibly, you know, Niall wasn't busy at the time or something like that. Just something a little different to do. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and then the thing came up and then now I'm just doing this. So definitely. And, uh, and here we are, we've got uh, a shit ton of new material 
that we're going to be releasing this year. And nice. yeah, man, it's been a lot of fun. You know, uh, it's great to uh, jam with my old school homies. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, man. It's, it's great totally music. Awesome. I love yeah, it. totally. Awesome. And it it feels awesome. like there are a lot of different influences, you know. Mm-hmm. I definitely caught some like Norwegian black metal in there. Yeah, me times, too. You know, like there's bands like notable bands that I kind of just felt the essence of in there. Obviously, with an original, it is a unique sound too. Like it's the combination of everything, and it has its stamp, your stamp, and everybody who was involved stamp on it, no doubt. I was just saying Thanks. that, you know, yeah. But the Norway, there were some monstrosity feels in there. Like I'm, I'm catching a bunch of stuff from it and it was, I was rocking out, dude. Like, to be honest, like I, I just got into it recently and, uh, but I, the narcotic wasteland thing, like that gave it like a punk grindy feel to me just from like the visual, you know, and then you get into it and, you know, mat- uh, like lyrical, lyrical stuff about it. It was all like, kind of punk and grind to me you know like so what was the influence on that name narcotic wasteland um it came from the first song that uh, i wrote for the band which was called widespread narcotic wasteland and um, you know it it did kind of stem from uh just some of the shit that i've seen (laughs) since i've been you know been able to really see and understand what's going on, you know, as an adult in the world Mm -hmm. and, um, traveling and, uh, you know, the, the, that song actually talks about some real instances that occurred and, and it, that from there, it just kind of grew, but, you know, at the same time, like, which is going to be pretty present on the new record of that sort of theme is there, but, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of other topics. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you know, that was just uh, something that kind of happened naturally, you know, and then we started talking about it just back and forth, you know, me or Ed or me and Chris and, you know, uh, and it just kind of was born. And and then the same thing with the uh, the early the album art for the debut record and the album art for Delirium Tremens. Mm-hmm. Uh <laughs> that's a great one me and chris were talking on the phone well as we do you know you talk uh, talk to one of your bandmates for a couple hours just talk about the band talk about different stuff mm-hmm. that's where a lot of good stuff is done you know totally. and uh, and so we were just on one of our things and we were just like man we how about just making this really evil like medical symbol you know mm-hmm. and uh and of course, we did discover that yes, that's kind of like you know, Doctor Feelgood had the Caduceus on there as well, and it's like okay, well, whatever, we're gonna make ours extra evil. Yeah, and um, and it worked. Uh, Which is yeah, and, uh, yeah, you know, it, for the name, it goes perfect with the name, you know, definitely. Yeah, you know, and it kind of touches on a little bit of the uh, things that we talked about on Delirium Tremens, which was you know. Um, Pharmaceutical, some pharmaceutical companies not giving a shit about your health. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're just gonna patch them up, make them feel good, and uh, throw them a know. white chemical of some sort packed into a little pint size, or not pint size, but like small little <laughs> thing that he could take with some water, dude. He's good. <laughs> yeah, just whatever it he may can't be. Shit, he won't be able to shit for like three days if he keeps going with it, but <laughs> he'll be fine, dude. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some. Uh, there's some, uh, a lot of people went down that path, you know what I mean? And yeah, you think, you, you know, you hear about people dying to street drugs and stuff like that too, but you also hear a lot more, especially lately about people, um, dying, abusing drugs, that drugs they were prescribed. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I, I don't know it. No, and like that, like I said, that that's a perfect symbol for you know that type of content, that type of band name, you know, um, that evil, that symbol, but evil because that's basically what how I feel as well. Like I'm I'm gonna try and avoid pharmaceuticals at all costs. Like you know, if you're having uh, uh, arthritis or you know swelling, go 
drink more water get moving like get your muscles fucking loosened up again like you've been sitting down for too long you know or change your diet like that kind of thing yeah Um, and there's alternatives too i mean um, i mean obviously there is and when i say that there are good things about medicine obviously yeah yeah Sure. Totally. If it's, used like, it's not just like all of it's bad, but you know, like but there's some serious problems. The addictive, though, for sure. the addictive yeah. chemicals that they've been making a profit off of for so long. That's what was dri- made a narcotic wasteland. I was driving behind a bus yesterday, and it, and it had like an ad on the back, like a city bus, and it was like fentanyl laced with meth kills. And I was just like, people even do that? I was like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, dude. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, definitely kills it. That's taking the hippie speedball to like like, the stars, like taking it to the full maximum fentanyl and crystal meth. I mean, we've all had friends die from that stuff in in recent years. And I fucking, that's yeah. Yeah. In 2019, uh, the last show that we played was at this thing called foam hinge. It was a brewing company somewhere in Texas. And, um, uh power trip was on the bill oh oh wow yeah and uh there you go uh, i yeah. i heard that it was fentanyl yep that's yep. what i heard too same fucking thing that killed prince yeah yeah you know um, i mean i felt the shit. pull dude i've broken i've broken bones and and felt the pull from that shit you know like you totally take vicodin and you're like i know exactly why people get addicted to this i feel great right now i don't feel yeah. the pain and and also i feel like i'm floating off the fucking couch right now you know it's like it but then the downfall and you're the chasing the dragon after that you're you know yeah. in the beginning it's kind of like uh oh this is this is helping me and then like then the prescription runs out and then you're like yeah. well i still want that feeling and that's where people and the doctor's and like the, no and then you go to the the black tar or something you know mm-hmm. you go to something that's well, harder to, well the fentanyl is just added to it and just kills people like it's not even like they don't even know it's just oh shit and then you you know yeah there's a lot of that going on with all the all drugs fucked up. Well, not yeah. only that like yeah. the, the the guys who were dealing the heroin they put a little fentanyl in there or whatever yeah. i heard that they they gate they'll throw a little bit more if if uh if sales are low they'll throw a little bit more in there hoping that somebody fucking ods so then everybody else sees that they od'd and they're like oh i need his shit and then he gets the boost in sales after that dude somebody died for his fucking you know being a little lazy on his ratios on purpose it's pretty dark yeah yeah dude i mean don't they have to like wear gloves and like if you touch it you have to like take like a, a, a different drug immediately or you're going to OD. It's like, fuck. Is that video of that cop stuff, like with the, with the gloves on, like and he falls over, like passes out. Jesus. Uh, anyways. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, but yeah, that's terrible, man. Um, dark shit, dude. Yeah. You know, uh, I think ultimately, I mean, with kind of what we want to do is, and, and yeah, you know, we're not always, we haven't always written, you know, songs about drugs and shit. Uh, yeah, no, it was the dark idea stuff that we like to talk beginning. on. Um, the, we uh, did a song that basically talked about um, South Carolina's most prolific serial killer. And uh, that was one of our favorites. Um, just uh, toxic human behavior. Um, was that like Green River? About that. Huh? Was that Green River killer? Like- South no, Carolina? no, no, no. Um, this guy was named Donald Henry Gaskins. And um, he, I read the book. He's, he was a horrible, horrible person. I mean, if you did not believe in the death penalty, he would make you want to believe in it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. That's how horrible of a son of a bitch he was. But, uh, you know, so I wrote a song about that. And I think that was because of just growing up in Carolinas and, I kind of know how he could have had the potential to end up that way. (laughs) Uh, So I don't know. Uh, Human behavior is very interesting to me. So that's kind of been what I've been more focusing on lately. Uh, Of course, drug use is always going to be there Mm -hmm. Um, and not good drugs either. Yeah. Yeah, 
with your the name of narcotic wasteland when i first heard it i immediately thought of my tour life like all the, the crazy towns like in wyoming and all the crazy super drug addicted towns that just when we'd go through there because we're from you know sunny california and we're driving through you know uh a little rock or not little rock uh rock springs wyoming and it's like and it's the highest you know meth capital of whatever and they're just all their signs on the on the fucking freeway are just talking about like don't like quit mess go here quit mess do you know it's like that the whole town was completely taken over and i and uh, I watched a documentary on that town, too. And it's just like it just ravages like full. It makes me your name made me think of uh, Rock Springs, Wyoming, just completely ravage a wasteland of these these trailers and these these people running around just like that truck stops that are just fucking insane, you know, just completely toothless. And it just reminds me of like a zombie apocalypse, you know, just like these zombie mutants walking around, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, and that um, you know, unfortunately, that's how we felt about our hometown. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, back then it, there was meth, but it was mostly crack. OK. Um, and uh, yeah, people were ruining their lives on that shit. You know, and I, I was I, I, you know, I was kind of looked bad upon to like you know, my neighbors or whatever. I was like, yeah, man, you know, at the time I had the long hair and yeah, I smoke fucking weed and I drink beer and I play loud music. You know. But that's as far as it goes. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? it doesn't and it's count. not like I do that all the fucking time either. I mean, when you start getting on uh, the meth thing or whatever, I mean, those people want to do that shit like constantly. Yeah. Like, man, I would have a fucking headache or die if I did that. There's yeah. a we, there's a reason that weed's legal and alcohol is even though people abuse alcohol crazy but like like beer and weed is you know yeah yeah I mean it's people figure out a way to doing... abuse anything you know oh for sure yeah yeah but it's there's like... people that smoke way too much weed <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, absolutely Definitely. absolutely but. But Did it's like that? was that smoking it, too much weed? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Anthony. <laughs> Speaking of, yeah. No, but, uh, but it's hard to just like be like super. Yeah, I'm, I'm super responsible, and I just like do meth, you know, like a little bit. Just, <laughs> there yeah. are people you don't like hear that. There I know, are I know, it's meth crazy. Addicts out it's, there, dude. I, well, it's just yeah, a it's definitely all aspect. Yeah, it's all aspect like an oxymoron. Way too many people out there for that not to be a possibility. Well, I wouldn't let them babysit my kids. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, down here in the Southeast, we've, we've got the wasteland here too. I mean, there's some damn, some sad fuckers around here with that yeah. shit. And the, the, you know, they're living in these horrible places and, you know, it's always like extremely filthy and, you know, and it, really we can't necessarily blame the person all the time. Of course we are responsible for the decisions that we make. But we also have to think about the environment that they grew up in. You know, yeah. um, I didn't come from a perfect family, but I did come from a good family. Mm -hmm. And uh, that makes a huge difference right huge there. Huge difference. Yeah. You know, when you talk about these these kind of street drugs, we're talking about uh, a perpetuation of that lifestyle through generations. And yeah. uh, and yeah. and good they point. imagine being born into that. Where that was life. That's wow. that would be yeah. normal for you. Doing that yeah. shit, you know what I mean? Like it would be normalized at some point growing mm -hmm. up. If it was constantly, if you grew up, your childhood was through that. There's the time would be when you go over to a friend's house or something, which I don't know if you would be able to, but you get to a friend's house and you see how their family dynamic is. Then you're like, oh wait, my shit isn't normal. Like yeah there isn't supposed to be random people in my living room while i'm trying to fall asleep at you know 2 a.m and i'm eight years old and i can just hear partying going on in the living room downstairs or something like that because my parents fucking do drugs or whatever yeah yeah uh i um 
I'll probably subject it to my my son to some of that minus the drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just had a, we were probably had a, having a couple of drinks, having a late barbecue or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I know. I, that was me just coming up with some shit in the moment. But yeah, I, oh, I, no, definitely, no, I we've definitely been up too late for our kids as well. <laughs> but I guess the two, oh, yeah. two stories makes it a little easier. Yeah, but, uh, you know, that's something that one of the lyrics in... Keeping up with the Jones uh, says is basically, uh, and it's true. And I think, especially if you're a parent, you've seen it that uh, not everybody really takes the job of being a parent seriously enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's the line they will never leave the cradle of their misled, intoxicated youth. And then there's the other one that, uh, you know, uh, most of them stay sedated just to cope with their neglected children. There you go. That's the mm-hmm. one. Oh, wow. <clears throat> yeah. Willingly systematically keeping up with the Jones. Yeah. That's the, that's the line. And uh, that was one of my observations about just uh, people not being good parents and not being paying their kids enough attention. Yep. You know, it's only going to be fun. Get down there and play with some cars in the dirt Go ride bicycles. Go Build some do Legos. All that shit. Go play you know, ball. Make up games. games. We'll fucking make up games, dude. <laughs> yeah. All yeah, the time. With with all the stick. time making shit up. I'm just like, dude, I'll put something over there and I'll be like, all right, everybody grab a car. First one to knock it over. Boom. That'll <laughs> yeah. go for like a yeah. half an hour. Half an hour. Yeah. End, dude. There it is. Yeah. You know, they uh, they bring the they naturally bring the kid out in us. If if you have the right head on your shoulders and you care. Um, and, uh, and, and it's one of those great things and a lot of great memories with video games of playing ball and riding bicycle and going and doing stuff and going on vacation. And, you know, uh, oh, your man. head, your head needs to be, as soon as you have a kid, your head needs to be focused on giving them the best environment possible to grow in. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, and that does not involve doing hard street drugs. Yeah, definitely not. You're not going to be able to juggle both. Trust me. We letting, my, uh, letting this guy out of hand seen, too, though. That, that could be can't a, a dark path as well. This oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. And I've definitely had my issues with alcohol, man. Mm-hmm. I definitely have. I'm not going to, I'm not a saint. I'm not some straight edge punk here trying to damn be a saint. Um, I've definitely had my bouts with it, but. I just stay away from the hard stuff mostly and just stick to beer and, you know, there you go. Uh, and, and not like a thousand of them, like maybe four or five in the evening. Yeah, definitely. Just get a nice little head change, make it, I mean, hard day at work, fucking mm-hmm. loosen up a little bit and have a good time. Not like, Oh, what did I do last night? Oh, sorry. Not, not like the blackout yeah, fucking dude. those but, are the worst yeah. those blackouts that, that can't happen when you got children. Yeah. like if you're having that conversation with your children yeah that's no go <laughs> yeah that's yeah, not, yeah totally i mean the right path dude i honestly don't even want to know how much alcohol it would take for me to black out <laughs> yeah me too um, <laughs> and uh you know i just i have shit to do too you know it's i, I mostly drink water during the day um, and coffee in the morning and the occasional Red Bull for the and, afternoon. Uh, you know, I, afternoon I like, uh, I like juices and stuff too. I like vegetable juice and orange juice. Um, but at the end, in the evening, I like some beers. There you go. <laughs> Definitely. That's all good. Definitely. Yeah. Going back to the, the family thing. I remember like having the good family, you know, play some ball, stuff like that. Like those are still things that when my, you know, I was a kid, my dad, introduced me to sports and you know watching the game with your dad and mm-hmm. and and i recently just you know bought two thousand dollar tickets for us to go watch the chiefs and cowboys play and we're flying out and it's still like resonating with me today like you guys all know how obsessed i am with football like totally I mean, that's all comes from my dad taking me watching joe montana play when i was a kid throwing the ball with my dad around like that stuff resonates Dude, huge, me, you, know? you and trevor my my trevor would run plays in my parents front yard do you remember that yeah, yeah. oh yeah definitely that's when he was super young he was like three or four that's stuff that just kids never forget you know like even yeah. i'm not a I'm, I'm i'm into baseball but i don't really like baseball that much to watch but man my dad would take me to baseball games and stuff and that's still if i get to go to a baseball game 
playing what team A's against whoever. I'm just like, fuck yeah, let's go fucking watch. I the wonder game, the you know? percentage of the main like football is their main thing actually like baseball because you're used to all the action is constantly happening and baseball is more of kind of I don't want to call it a waiting sport, but it is. There's more waiting for things to happen. That's you're just yeah. wanting the action all the time. That's why I want, like Call of Duty. It's just like you jump in, you're fucking shooting people right away. It's just instant dopamine, you know, like. It's instant ADHD. No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, that shit's definitely fucking important, man. That shit's super important. Totally. I mean, team team men. Yeah, I, I love that we're talking about the parent stuff because like everything that Dallas just said, I was like, oh, dude, I think I check all those boxes. I think I'm a good parent, dude. I think I'm doing <laughs> it all, dude. I think I got it all. I think you're a good yeah, parent. Yeah, man. I mean, and really all you got to do is care. I mean. There's no have, real textbook dude. that says how to be a good parent. You, know, you get, I got that yeah. switch, dude. As soon as I became a dad, dude, I was a dad. You know, mm-hmm. like yeah, I was immediately like, like that became yeah, that became my first thing, and then everything else gets reorganized underneath that. You know, which was really a, me. Was a like lot of those uh, dr- like we're talking about the families raising their kids around drugs. I think those are a lot of people that just. Oh, you're pregnant? Well, we're going to still do our same thing, right? Just with the kid around. Like, it's like, they're <laughs> no basically way, like, dude. oh, oh yeah. we like to have sex when we're on drugs. Oh, shit, you're going to have a thing, like a baby coming out now? Well, we're going to, you know, we'll figure it out. Yeah, Let's dude. Go back to the party. Keep doing dude. that at five. They're going to come in to get in your bed at night. and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And you're going to have to deal with your kid with fucking big old eyes like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't you say ecstasy? Did you say ecstasy? <laughs> <laughs> no. Damn. Well, you just said dilated on ecstasy or, or not dilated but you're on ecstasy and having sex you didn't say that no uh, no all right sorry i was half listening <laughs> to you i didn't fully listen to you <laughs> dallas, <laughs> it happens dallas what kind of guitars are those behind you dude those look uh, sick uh that is uh there's four bc rich iron birds in that rack and then oh, there's dude, my nice. uh my old ibanez destroyers in there as well um, and then back behind me here, I got the Jacksons and the Charvel, but yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's part of the ones that are sir appearing in my life right now. Are you still, uh, doing the old school, uh, Marshall's the JCM 900 you're playing out of? Yeah, I'm still using that for recording. Um, I got a PV triple X that I use for a live use cause it's just a solid amp and it always just works. And, mm-hmm. um, it's going to be going in for a retube but I'm going to be installing some new electronics and some of those older BCs over there. But also I'm going to be sending the amps in for a service pretty soon because it's going to be time to play some shows and also time to record. So do you have a solid date for recording? Is that all planned out or is it kind of just up in the air right now? It'll probably be sometime after August. I'm hoping because we had the shows, um, you know, last month. And then, uh, the plan was kind of to just hold off on the shows until the ones we have in August and just try to see how much more we can get done before then. Yeah. And, uh, just keep playing it by ear that way. And, um, and hopefully have something to listen to new, uh, by sometime yeah, later in the year, at least. But a lot of, not necessarily a lot of stuff to iron out with the music, but just the logistics of everything and, and how we're going to, because we may, we may fly out and go to, you know, when we go to mix it, we may go fly there and, and mix it, you know, that kind nice. of thing. So there's still just a few uh, logistical things we got to figure out. But so uh, as a dad, what's, what's your window to do all this? Just, is it sporadic? Well, um, uh, my son, he is 22 years old. He oh, is okay. in the Air Force. Oh, oh nice. Okay. So he's he's kind of flown the nest. He's, he hadn't lived here in almost three years. Wow. Uh, he went and uh, did basic with the Air Force, came back on leave, and then he went to school to work on, learn to work on aircraft. Oh, nice. Um, and I talked to him on Sunday. We had a good conversation and I've went there to visit him and, you know, he comes back on leave when he's got some leave time or whatever and, uh, and all that stuff. So I'm pretty free at the moment. I've got okay. some empty nest syndrome going on. Yeah. Uh, 
but uh yeah you know we talk pretty regularly and uh i plan on going to visit him probably i'm gonna try and get down there in july he's stationed in florida so i'm gonna try and get down there in july it's about a seven hour drive not that bad um and go hang out for three or four days or something and hit some there's a he said there was a retro arcade there so we'll probably go hit that of course restaurants and watch movies and the last time i went and visited him i think we like uh like completely binge watched two seasons of Cobra Kai in my hotel room. Or whatever. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, of course, went and checked out the base and all that um, aircraft and stuff they have there. They have awesome. uh, one of the, um, they got the Blackbird. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. As a kid, that was like my, that was my plane. <laughs> like, that was it, man. So you're playing, dude. When you, did you did you have toys and shit? Like oh yeah, plane? I mean, I, my dad would take me to the uh, the air show. Air show was like a huge deal for us. So we'd go out and watch, you know, the A10s and F14 Tomcat. Obviously, I was a big you know, Top Gun kid, and like all the Top Gun. I went to the danger zone, dude. Yeah, I had all those, <laughs> all those, and like uh, stealth bombers and shit. And yeah, that was like. This, they actually, I went to a football game where a stealth bomber did a flyover once. I was like, what? And I was so like excited. Like my fucking inner eight-year-old came out and I was flipping oh, out. Yeah. Yeah, the- I got to see the Harrier at the air show. Oh, me before too. Before they had to decommission yeah. the damn thing because people kept crashing them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, was- sick. It was so sick. So sick. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, that's... That why why they keep so- crashing? Um, they're just really complicated to maneuver with the with the way the the thrust system works, and people just lose it, lose control of it, and fucking slam really? into some buildings. Fuck. But yeah, luckily, was... they were hovering when they did it. It wasn't like they were going fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were just kind of levitating a little bit, and just you know, maybe the wind. The wind got a well, good gust of wind. The wind and knocked them into a building. It's like yeah. the but people just, who, who really take off on a motorcycle and can't working. keep it from. Running into a fence or some shit. <laughs> yeah. So they're like, actually uh, going to be building the new. Um, oh man, they're because Lockheed Martin is here in uh, in this area of South Carolina. They're building the new. Is it the F sixteen? Okay. Or the F fifteen. It's the new. I believe it's the new F fifteen, and it has F thirty five and F twenty two DNA. Hmm. Damn. That's, yeah, is that the one that took them like a trillion dollars to make or something? There was one that's like the something. There's like a that. huge gazillion dollar contract with Lockheed Martin. Yeah. Yeah. To make those. And it's a beautiful plane. And it's just cool because it already, that plane already has a legacy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pretty killer shit. Uh, what exactly does your son do in the Air Force? What's on? What's his- uh, he's a maintainer. He works on some of the mechanical, but mostly the electronical stuff. Uh, nice. The electronics on the on the aircraft, mm-hmm. and they keep them running. Sweet dude, nice. I, I'm in automotive, so I can kind of relate. I mean, obviously, I'm, he's working on planes, but just being that guy to keep shit intact. I work on shuttle buses and shit. You know, working for hotel shuttle buses. So it's like they got a bunch of them keeping those going. So it's like kind of like the same mentality. Is that yeah. was he a mechanic before he went into it or anything like that? Was he in, involved uh, in the cars and no. shit? No. Uh, well, yes no. and no. Um, I come from a long line of mechanics, actually, okay. and uh, I know a little bit myself. Um, I do most of my own maintenance on my truck, and uh, well, when he got of age to drive, I bought him a third generation Firebird, like the Night Night Rider. Nice. And uh, he paid to have the transmission fixed and uh, and um, been doing it ever since, uh, doing work on it, both of us ourselves ever since. And uh, he just did the water pump on it himself. Nice. Oh, nice. That's a, actually yeah. a hard, so, hard motor to work on. Mm, that's the 3.1 liter. Uh, oh, okay. I'm had. sorry. I'm thinking of a newer generation then. Yeah, no, the third gen. Remember Knight Rider, the show Knight Rider? Mm-hmm. See, I'm trying to picture it in my head, and I pictured the wrong <laughs> generation, dude, because I never really yeah. watched it, you know? 
I just yeah. What, well, basically, it is the third generation Pontiac Firebird. It ran from I think that body style ran from 1982 to 1992. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, it's a cool body. It's nostalgic and old school as fuck at this point. But when it came out, you know, it was futuristic as hell. But I raised him on old Night Rider and shit like that. Nice. We always loved the car, so I. I found one for a pretty good deal and we fixed it up and he's driven it from Texas to here and from here to Florida. And Sick. Yeah. That's a good car. It's uh really it's been, it's been very reliable and um, he's done a lot of work and upgrades to it. Nice. Oh yeah, definitely. Actually getting back to guitar. I had a question about your, your right hand technique that you, definitely are unique with because you do that upward kind of picking with your hand out right that's like Mm, you continue i I was gonna say like where you got your influences from playing guitar and where where that i mean did you just adopt that on your own or was that something that you saw on a video or something or because that's basically i know that you know uh, paul from origin and and you know the uh, mike from severed savior they do the under one where they go like this. They like curl it under. You go out like this, right? You're kind of like out picking a different technique. Yeah. Um, that was something I was doing for a little while because I had a ne- this necessity of a certain speed that I was trying to achieve, but I also was trying to achieve a certain sound. And honestly, I haven't picked that way in over okay. a decade. Oh, wow. Um, just to grab a guitar real quick. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. And it'd probably be better if I uh, Hell yeah. just grab a strap real quick. That would be better. <laughs> I'll just grab this guitar. So, this will be better. This one's already ready to go. So, yeah, the thing that you're talking about was something that I used to do that was kind of more like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, what ended up happening was, is eventually I ended up hitting kind of a speed cap with that. And I kind of went back to a more normal way. Oh, okay. You know, and gotcha. that just, that worked better. And, you know, for everything, it just, so it's been like this for a long time now. Um, okay. I probably made this full switch over in about 2008. Because this was starting to just get, you know, I don't know. It just wasn't, I wasn't progressing any further from that. So I started to get a little bit more relaxed when I was playing. And it was probably just me having more strength in my hands as well. Were you, um, so like, it, I'm were you more ground- relaxed now. That old school technique, was that more for like, cause you're, I see you're grounding your, like your, your palm on the guitar on that old school technique. Was that more just for like a stamina Cause you have to like go for, you know, Niles so fucking constant with the, with the speed picking and stuff. Was that more adopted through stamina or was that just something you just were doing? I, uh, I don't ever care about stamina cause stamina will, will happen. All you got to do is just keep at it. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. uh, I, I think I was just able to have more control and, um, you know, uh, practicing say for instance, if you're going down this way, doing something if you're yeah. descending try starting with an upstroke yeah and what that does is put all your pick strokes on the outside of the string stuff like that um yeah, yeah. and it just all that stuff kind of um helped me grow and become better and Definitely. i've always kind of initially when i was you know yeah. trying to play like that it was because i was getting a really tight sound with it at okay. least i thought so but um you know, this is just way more relaxed and I have a lot more power this way. Definitely. Um, Definitely. And it, it'll, it, it shows on the recordings. It's really going to show this time on some of the riffing and stuff. Uh, there's, there's a lot of that true 16th notes, not eighth note triplets that everybody tries yeah. to tell you is 16th notes. No, this yeah, is exactly. the real shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, tightly palm muted as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's uh you know any of the stuff works and any of it's great but for certain things i just love that super tight chunky thrashy shit dude was that tough thank you for showing that to us dude i was hoping you were going to grab a guitar 
that's why i brought it up earlier oh yeah yeah no problem and i'm just dude like i'm seriously like just so down right now (laughs) yeah that was sick i'm I'm, I'm hanging on every word man i'm hanging on every word how hard was it to how hard was it to switch that style up because you had to pretty much relearn your picking then right or is it something you just always did um well and that was the funny thing the other uh the kind of more strong arm or stiff arm technique Mm -hmm. only arose when i needed those um those those fast 16th notes sure right the rest of the time the rest of the time it was in that same regular kind of stance where it was just like yeah yeah you know but no, 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 we start trying to pick faster and that arm would yeah. raise up and I start just like kind of going doing right. my hand like that. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm making Schwarzenegger noises like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you got to pick the guitar. Yeah. You're like, this is chopper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm just oh, like, yeah. Yeah. you know, total manual labor type <laughs> shit. And, uh, uh, you know, and you, you're just going to hit a cap that way. Uh, yeah. It's not necessary to use that much energy. You're actually yeah. going to not get as fast. So uh, it is about pace and stamina, but it's also about just how you attack the string. And everybody's hands are different, so it works. I mean, you have other people that kind of – I remember I've been through a few different picking techniques, and uh, I used to hold my pick this way okay, with the thumb out, and I was yeah. actually going like that. Oh, and weird. then one day I was like, you know what? I think that sounds like shit. Yeah. And I started playing with it, turn the other way like that. Yeah. And that was just, they had mm-hmm. more scrape, uh, more pick attack. The other one started to sound a little flubby, but I was probably just getting tired of being in my own head at that point, you know? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. It's very cool. <laughs> yeah. I have my, my, uh, my buddy, Carrie actually holds the pick. Fuck. I don't have a pick near me. He holds it with like this where he's got, the pick oh, pointing yeah. down right here, and he hits pinch harmonics by putting his ring finger on the string oh, uh, really? behind it, and hits pick harmonics wow. like that. He doesn't. He doesn't actually dig in for the pick harmonic. He just goes like that on his thumb. <laughs> it, it, it comes from his finger. Comes from his pick harmonic. Comes from his ring finger. It's like Interesting. <laughs> totally weird style. I mean, I know that he was he grew up watching like James Hetfield and stuff, so I know James holds his pick like that. And so then he, That's I think, crazy. I don't I think. Love, oh yeah, every kid wanted to hold their pick like, like that. that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the Fucking Field green pick. tortix. Do you uh, yeah. use the use the sharp <laughs> use the sharp picks? Use the sharp tortex? The purple sharp yeah. one? So for a dummy that doesn't n- nice. know how to do a pinch harmonic, how the fuck do you what, so you're saying Carrie's uh style is unorthodox. How is the normal style then? The normal style is you pick into the string, let it bounce back into your thumb. Right? Is that how you guys do it? Yeah, it'll yeah. It'll, yeah. it'll rub onto the thumb and uh, you know it, it'll rub onto the thumb and you know it gets that. Yeah, yeah it's like a you ca- you catch it's it's that a pinch. rub, dude. It's all about so the it's rub, on your pick dude. finger though. Yeah, I always yeah. thought it was something that you were doing it's on. Like, well, on there's the natural network. harmonics. There's like natural harmonics the... you can hit by just by hitting the string and the harmonic. But then there's uh, yeah. okay. Yeah, like you can't really hear it acoustically, but through an amp, it'll just like, you know, screams. put your eyeballs out. Totally, yeah. 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 If you want to plug in, man, feel, like, feel free. Really like I just that, no, this is something that I'm learning. I had no idea the pick hand had anything to do with it. Well, Dimebag, fucking, you know, that's like what Dimebag's. Actually, he did all the harmonics, but the, yeah, he really dug in with. But those I love, I love so. more now that Kerry Gear style is fucking out, different than all y'all motherfuckers, dude. And that's why I fucking <laughs> yeah. under it's a western so sun will blow your fucking ass out of this <laughs> shit, dude. <laughs> yeah, out of this super, shit, dude. unorthodox. Yeah. I mean, I actually didn't even I jam with him for years before I knew he was doing that because he would just hit every harmonic perfectly, just like like screaming harmonic and i would just like do the pinch and miss it every now and then and this is that like that missing pinch harmonic noise which is every guitar player's nightmare especially when you're on the low with you know i don't know what you guys tune into you guys tune into a like nile are you going a little higher um for half the songs we are in d sharp standard and for the other half we are in d standard okay gotcha uh for the d sharp guitars i use regular 10 gauge and for the uh d standard guitars i use 11s try to keep okay. the tension and the feel of the guitar uh, i try to keep them as thinner. similar as that how it goes? possible wider huh wider 11 so higher numbers bigger obviously yeah bigger. a little bit a little bit thicker yeah to accommodate for the lower tuning and keep the the string tension right and the intonation you know as proper as possible 
have you messed with any of those guitars that the kids are playing with nowadays those multi-scale guitars that have like the 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 fan frets and have like i don't know i've never screwed with one of those i know that they're they're made for that keeping that tension on the low string so you don't really have to change have gauges right here, too much actually really <laughs> really it's not mine but it's literally right here hold on of course the professor has you know it's nothing to do yeah. with my job dude <laughs> I think but, that but you are the, the professor <laughs> though you're still the professor it doesn't matter that you are oh uh, yeah. dude that's the a fan total... frets they, they call that fan frets and yeah. i think what that really has to do with it it probably has something to do with the feel of the strings and stuff too of the, yeah. the string tension but what it probably really helps with is the intonation of the string and um yeah uh, guitars actually don't go in perfect tune. Yeah, not like a piano can go in perfect tune or it's whatever. It's like those uh, those true temperament. Uh, have you seen those those true temperament um, frets where they're all like squiggly lines, trying to get as close as they can to like perfect. Yeah, in tune? Steve Vai guitar had something like that. Where like on the yeah, uh, it's of course the shittiest string on the guitar, which is the DMG string. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that one's like divoted down it's like got a v right there uh so fan frets are kind of doing that too um to get the intonation more true mm. and then um just in case you know uh, you guys may know this but basically the intonation is the distance between on any string the distance between the nut at the top of the neck and the 12th fret has to be the same distance between that and the bridge mm -hmm. And um, the more true you get that, the more, because if your intonation is out, you may be kind of in tune up here, but as soon as you go up here, it doesn't yep. sound right. And uh, then that's, I think that's why the fan frets are a thing. Yeah. Especially when you start talking about guys that aren't tuning standard yeah, um, or anything near standard. Uh, you want that longer scale. If you are dropping down, if, you know, if I was to be in a band that played that low again, I would honestly probably just go with a seven strain. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't tune down a six. You guys yeah, were in which I did. I did a now for years and years, and it was fine. But I, in retrospect, you know, I probably would go with a seven. Was the, was uh, it's the more designed for the lower tuning? You yeah. Know? Was the Nile tuning like a like basically just a drop drop A? Was that what Nile? It was? would be. I I would call it drop B because the guitar would be in B, except you just drop the one string down to A. A, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So yeah, um, and that yeah, that's the tuning. Yeah, and then of course I used uh, thirteen through seventy on that set. It's the oh, same, yeah. trying to keep the ten the tension on the neck right. Yeah. And so the strings aren't flapping around everywhere when I'm trying to, you know, go and all that shit. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and that, that was it, you know, just trying to find that. And, uh, one of my earlier bands was in B standard funny. And I used the, the, um, the jazz mediums, which is 13 to 56. Okay. And then ended up sliding that out into a 60. And that mm -hmm. was pretty tight. You know, you, you just don't want that floppiness or shit flopping around, you know? Yeah. Cause we tend to, when we get excited, we tend to play kind of hard. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Well, well, you guys definitely don't, but lots of bands do want the floppiness. That's like part of the modern death metal or like modern really? rock metal sound. We're not it's talking like floppy modern now. Death metal right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but we, I had this conversation with my bandmates a little while ago and my guitarist uses a drop G string with as, as, as a 64 gauge and he wants that doom with it like kind of starts a little higher and then drops into the right tuning. That's like what he's going for. And yeah, I was like, floppiness. and we were talking about how with Niall, you uh, you wouldn't want that. You would want it to just gen and just be in tune from the very first, you know, the whole time. Yeah. So. Uh, it's like a oh, rubber yeah, band Nile chord or rubber bandy yeah. style. Sure. Yeah, the big <laughs> dial chord. Sure. Yeah. yeah, we all know that. <laughs> yeah. We're not talking about flip flop. And flip flops and, uh, you know, that's, too, that's way too floppy dude <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but uh, i mean yeah. you know mashuga would would want the floppiness and anything yeah. downstream from mashuga is a, is a different sound that they're looking for and it's it's interesting that there are different size strings for these different sounds is all i'm saying yeah yeah dude it's dallas I, I got a story that i have to like tell you that's like a big part of my metal history so like i saw you in nile like 
in high school, like um, in like Santa Ana, like near LA, and uh, mm -hmm. me and so my friend, da yeah, the, the Galaxy dude, you know, dude. And so it was, it was with Cannibal Corpse. It was like 2000, yeah. I think. Yeah. And uh, I was like 17. And dude, like me and my friend David, who later we, we made Odious and all that, Odious Mortem, and whatever. Anyways, and so we, we were in high school still, and we were just rocking out. And we were just like, Niall, like, fuck, it's so fucking sick, dude. Mm -hmm. Insane. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was, that was a Tony, Lur Tony on Loriana. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. With the buzz saws mm -hmm. and all that. Anyways, we were just like, fuck, so sick. And then, of course, you know, Cannibal comes on, we're rocking out. And then we're just rocking out, just like headbanging in the front of the stage. Like, we're like 17 years old. And dude, you come up to me and my friend David, and you like come up to us with your hands and your sh on our shoulders, and you're just like headbanging with us, dude. Like, rocking out to Cannibal, dude. And, I, and we were just like, it's the dude from Nile, dude. Like, rocking out with us. And we were just like, fuck yeah. <laughs> that was good times, man. Damn. I must have been in rare form that night. That is not yeah. my normal behavior. <laughs> no, it was fucking awesome. We were just like, dude, no, you're just like right next to us, you know? Then you were just like to us, like, fuck yeah. And we were just rocking out. Like, we were just like so stoked, man. So, no, you said that wasn't your normal behavior. What is your normal behavior? You get at kind of just go chill out after the show and after you guys play. Chill out, maybe a shower of food. I will go check out the show, though. Um, yeah, I've definitely yeah. been known to do that just about every night. Um, cause that's why we're all there anyways. Totally. Check out you the beers yeah, before yeah. the show or beers totally. after the show anytime, or is that like, yes, a, yes. <laughs> you drink. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't do too much before the show. A couple of beers to get uh, loose or whatever. Kind of hard to play that. Yeah. Or just that's a couple same. of beers. Cause I drink beers. Yeah. You know, that's, that's just right normal now. for me. Cheers. Bro. Um, Cheers. Yasul. <laughs> I'm drinking a White Claw. It's kind of lame, but whatever. <laughs> Is that the iced tea one, too? No, no. Uh, but yeah. Basically, I remember uh, a quick story with uh, Necrophages. <laughs> they like... Remember Muhammad when we first... He first first show in San Francisco, we opened for him. And uh, he was like cussing... He was, came, brought me aside to cuss cuss me not cuss he's cussing out his guitar player he's like he doesn't drink doesn't drink he only has one one shot and one beer before a show the guy's a pussy i'm gonna kick him out of the band <laughs> blah blah i drink like kick him out of the band the show blah blah i'm like dude you drink mohammed said much before 10 that? beers something what? he was like saying all this you know how much he drinks and stuff he was like you know napoleon napoleon complexing <laughs> us a little too much like <laughs> with the, with the I've, yeah, I've toured with him a couple times but yeah. he definitely like got you know cooler as you know i don't know he he seems way too focused on stage to have 10 beers before he goes that's what he was saying like a severe alcoholic like, dude all those solos and shit you have to you i can't drink and play like that like any kind of a solo like when i'm drunk if i'm actually drunk you it's know it's basically all well, you toured with him a bunch but i i every time i've seen necro it was fucking on point like robotic style you know yeah so it's like so that fuck, German dude. fucking wonder what game. happens if he gets sober he like fucks up or something <laughs> what if he's that he guy? overthinks it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah he might just be that wound up you know uh, some people's got to do it that bad to get loose um, and if he's experienced then he probably just has a really high tolerance and it didn't fuck with him and it yeah. was just I think enough two beers maximum that's the slippery slope I remember when I started. Uh, when I became old enough to drink and I started, I was like, ah, fuck, I'm going to pick up a beer before practice. Yeah. And I remember it would be like, okay, well, I'll, I'll get me one of these ice houses. And, um, <laughs> I'll get an ice house and a pack of cigarettes and a bag of Doritos or whatever. And of course we might, somebody there probably like passing a bowl around or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I remember I was like, well, this is pretty cool. We'll have a beer during practice, you know, nothing heavy. And then it turned into two ice houses, yeah. and then three, yeah. and then four. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah dude. <laughs> and then it's going. like, you know what? I think I'm just not going to drink at practice. I think I'll just buy these, and then we can have some after. And uh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'll still have a couple, but you know, um, it's just there because I like it. It's not, you know, I'm not trying to catch the buzz. I was kind of getting back to what we were saying earlier you know, the, about the slippery slope with it. It's like, 
when I when I drink a beer, I'm not on some super Satan mission to get fucked up. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just having a couple beers right here. We're just having. Yeah, like, I'm here to drink these, a few. These beers people have- with their with their finger pointing. You know, it's just like calm down. No, dude. I'm just having a fucking beer. I'm almost. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. gonna be 47 years old this week. Can I have a beer? <laughs> Damn. This is like the only time. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, last weekend I did drink, but it's like this is basically the only time during the week that i go for it you know and i don't even go for it it's like i have three four beers during this but i do have plenty of cannabis with it but <laughs> it's like I, that's that's my maximum dude because we're doing this on a work night anyways you know i gotta fucking get up for work now then <laughs> like i don't even want to do the math <laughs> as long as I, can, I i don't sleep longer than five or six hours anyways so i'm good yeah, I, I could, I could do that. That's bad though. I mean, it's good. It, like, I understand like you have a, I, cause I do it too. Six hours is like more, I love eight, but six is more so what it is, dude. Cause yeah, it's like you weigh down at a certain time and you're like, I'm going to get eight hours. And then like you wake up at three, take a piss, start fucking around, look at your fucking phone. That's the worst. Mm, don't do, it, don't do it, man. I know. I'm trying not to now. I sometimes, because I'm like, I have, uh, speaking of, actually, I wanted to get into this a little bit, um, hearing protection and stuff, because I got really bad tinnitus and I'm like deaf in my right ear from touring and stuff. So oh, and I was shit. like one of the, and I was one of the best at wearing earplugs on stage. I was like, had my earplugs set up, you know, always like on top of my amp ready to grab and just put in um but yeah no i think it was you probably played there many times but it was at uh i've talked about it a couple times the el corazon in um yeah uh, seattle right seattle mm-hmm. i think that's uh um we were on with uh tour with black dahlia and um um trevor warned us before he was like do the opening band we we're like we're super green and he's all dude opening bands do not get treated well here by the sound people so just be prepared for it and i was like cool i had my we got a full sound check put my headphones or my earphones or earplugs on top of my amp um lights went out couldn't find them and i was like fuck it i can't find them it's gonna sound better anyway you know i'm 23 24 something like that at the time and i'm like fuck it you know it sounds great and i love the sound without earplugs i love it like it's my like the most visceral like you just get into it more um but it's obviously really damaging for your ears but um our singer got really close to the the uh, monitor and it, like shocking feedback hit me where it, basically i was blinded for a second and fell back on the drums and uh didn't really put two and two together it was just like oh my ears are ringing whatever and then i basically was like oh my ears like plugged or something like i don't know what's going on it's got like a maybe a wax build up or something like i was making all these things in my head i had no idea it was permanent ear damage i was like this is going to be fine. It's just like a wax buildup. I need to do one of those like pot things, put it in my ear and drain it out. You know, it was going through the motions in my head. I had full insurance at the time because I had a job and uh, I was like, fuck it. I'll just go to the ear, nose and throat doctor after and get it cleared out. And then they did all this tests, all these tests on me. And they're like, oh, you might have a brain tumor or your ears fucked for life. And I was like, or I mean, both. <laughs> I was like, what? You know, the doctor came in, was like, did that whole speech. Well, can you? can you live with this? Is this going to be something you can deal with? I was like, no, I'm a musician. This is not, I can't. Is there any way around this? He's like, well, we can get a, an earplug to put in there, or a, a, one of those hearing aids that will counteract the ringing, but you still can't hear out of it. And I was like, fuck. So for about six months, it was pretty tough. No sleeping. No, you know, it was just constant. And right now it's just ringing like crazy, but it's, it's been about 12 years, 13 years since that happened. So I've definitely got, got acclimated to it, but how do you do you wear earplugs on stage you do inner monitors do you what kind of protection is that do you take that super seriously especially like you know you've been you've done probably 15 times more tours than i've done i mean what how do you protect your ears um i unfortunately i've tried um earplugs and they've just never worked for me i've even spent money on um some ones that are supposed to just not change the sound and uh and just We're reduce the decibels. Heavy. Yeah. Um, and I've never heard any of them that can actually do that properly. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first set that I had that was supposed to just lower the volume on everything gave this 560 K honk to fucking guitars that actually hurt my ears. Um, <clears throat> so I always just try to keep the stage volume a little lower. Okay. And definitely just be like, Yes, keep those monitors low. I don't want 
because I've been lit up with bad feedback too. And I've been lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the first permanent damage I got was a small practice place I was in in an earlier band. And it was so small. I was literally hovering over the China symbol. Yeah. That'll get you. So that, that definitely did some damage there just in the left ear. But yeah, I, I just, and then, you know, if you're singing and you have earplugs in that, it sounds like you're singing in the bathtub Yeah, and or singing underwater or whatever. And it's just, I've never been able to do that and, um, and fuck it. And yes, I do have tonitis. Uh, I checked my range, my hearing range. You can go to YouTube and, and test your hearing uh, range, frequency okay. range okay, pretty easily. And uh, mine is slightly above average for human beings to this day, but I know that I've lost some because I'm not going to be able to hear past the ringing that's already there yeah. in those particular frequencies. Yeah. Uh, so the damage has been done, but like I said, uh, I just try to stay a little further away from the drums, which is impossible, but, you know, just try to keep a, the stage volume down because yeah. honestly you want it to feel powerful, mm -hmm. but you also don't want to compress your ears. It's just like when you're mixing an album, for instance, you don't want to mix the album listening to it loud mm -hmm. because your ears are going to compress and you're not going to be able to hear the details. If you want to, if you're trying to balance everything, you want to be able to hear the details in the high end and everything that's going on in order to balance that out. Um, so, you, you know, and then a live setting is of course, completely different animal, but if you want to be able to hear what you're doing so you can perform well, um, it's best not to push the stage volume too hard. Definitely. As long as I can hear the drums, a little bit of me, I'm good. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't have to sound like a fucking Grammy. If I can hear a little bit of my guitar and a little bit of my voice and I can def I, the most important thing is me and being able to hear the drums. Yeah. If I can hear the drums, then I can work with it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I'll be able to hear what I'm doing enough to, to, to get it right. And uh, do but vocals I gotta even that. matter at all to you when you're on stage. Do vocals Please. even matter? Uh, not in a, yeah, I'm not like asking that in a negative I, way. I, no, I, I like to have them there in the monitor so I can hear them and, and uh, you know, it just kind of helps me get the sound and the expression that I want. Mm -hmm. So it is yeah. helpful, but, you know, everybody's been to the place where the guy doesn't know what the fuck he's doing and yep. you still got to get up there and do it. So uh, I'm not reliant on any of that stuff. Uh, in a perfect world, yes, I would like to have a little bit of my vocal in the monitor. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I've done hard. so many gigs where you get up there and it's just a fucking wash. Yeah. And you're just like, well, okay, I can hear the drummer's right hand. I'll just stick to that. Yeah. As a straight <laughs> vocalist, that's happened to me where I can't hear myself at all, no matter what happens. And you go off a of feel and you just hope that it sounds fucking good. Or you just get your ass out into the crowd and then fucking listen to it on the fucking. <laughs> house pa dude well i would assume being a vocalist and stuff you i mean you know if you're touring constantly you don't want to blow your voice out because you don't know if you're being too loud or too quiet you yeah, don't know like i've done that dude you don't want to like push yourself too hard because you don't know if it's loud enough because you can't tell you know can't tell you the tone. enough shitty little clubs dude and you're gonna do that i've done yeah it, you know definitely there's a few things hard. you can do to help with that um i've, I've definitely um uh, kind of not necessarily blown my voice out but it just wasn't reacting the way I needed it to react. And um, it could have been part of not being able to hear myself, but uh, knowing that muscle memory and just knowing that, I don't know, knowing how to not push yourself because you can't hear yourself. Mm -hmm. That's something that you have to learn too. It's yeah. just like, okay. And that's what we all do. Especially when I was younger, I was like, I grew up singing into a PV combo amp. And yeah. you could never hear it in practice. So mm -hmm. I spent years and years and years of singing into this thing as loud as I fucking could. And that probably did me some good. Um, I've been known to blow an SM58 completely out. Damn, fuck. <laughs> oh, uh, shit. <laughs> yeah, I've done that a couple of times. Uh, but, and, th and that probably came from that. But also, you know, when you're out there on the road, 
and you do run into a situation where you may have pushed yourself or your voice is not working the way it should. Honey is a good thing to use. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't abuse it, but just something to coat the throat. And uh, during the day, shut the fuck up. Just don't talk. Yeah, dude. Perfect. (laughs) That's what I learned as well, dude. I have I I had a bottle of honey and I kept my talking to a minimum. Yeah, and and hydration too. Just water, man. There was Uh, a day that I didn't even talk at all. I was just like, dude, we're doing hand signals for the rest of the day, dude. (laughs) I got to make sure I'm good for the next one, you know. Not for you with also, you guys. Like actually with seven. blended coffees, iced coffee or a blended coffee. Like, uh, let's see, the Starbucks equivalent would be like a frappuccino. Yeah, something like that. Caramel frappuccino or something like that. Get so good for the throat. Yeah, yep. I get some phlegm going. I have a question. Actually, I've been wanting to ask um, for a long, long time, and it's just come up in practices and stuff like that, and also come in the what we're talking about tracking and stuff like that. There was a Carrie told me, I think he read in some interview or something that in Nile, did you guys track like, so on each side, was it like four tr- five tracks on each side or something like that? And that's what I was hearing that like you guys would double up like four times or something on each side. Uh, well, no, that's not quite accurate. Um, I think on some of the stuff we may have done six total tracks. Okay. Which was that that's just the rhythms. Uh, I've only personally the stuff that I tracked on rhythms um, unless it was in a song that already had more than four tracks. Um, I only use four and that's uh, that's two right and two left. Okay. The only reason why I would do that is because if there was a harmony part or something like that, that would play, that would play on the harmony would be on both sides. Okay. Um, So, two rhythms and two two harmonies One well side. no if there was just a harmony uh part in the rhythms oh gotcha. you, would, you would be able to hear it on both sides and in case you were listening to it on you know you were listening in fabulous mono or whatever yeah, uh, yeah. so and uh that thickened it up a little bit too it does thicken it up a little bit uh you have to be kind of meticulous about the picking and the performances uh when you start going more than a right and a left channel it can get a little blurry if you're not meticulous with it make sure you really nail it yeah and if you really nail it then you come back the next day you're gonna be like damn that's really tight a lot tighter than i remembered you know that's where (laughs) you want to be oh yeah Um, and yeah so uh, we did uh, use up to uh, three tracks aside for some of the slower stuff. Um, but in the earlier albums, like uh, Nefren Ka, uh, Black Seeds, and In Their Darkened Shrines, that was only a left and a right. Okay. And then I think maybe for like Sarcophagus or something like that, there would be more maybe one more or something, a thickener in the middle, or there would be four tracks. But yeah, that was right and left. That is definitely a thick one. <laughs> that song is fucking like, that was actually the the song that got me into to Nile because I was like still pushing, going off from my thrash metal, still not fully into death metal. And that music video that you guys did for that with you fucking like making your face and your, that picking we were talking about earlier, just like, with the fucking razor blade, uh, the symbol that was a razor blade and like that big old buff bass player and shit. <laughs> it was like, and then your, <laughs> yeah. face, your face was just fucking nasty, man. It was fucking literally like what got me more into the vocals and death metal. Cause you know, that's never a, for me, I mean, for most people, it's not an instant like, oh, I like this. It's like, oh, you got to kind of get into death metal vocals. It's not just like first time you hear it, you're in, you know, <laughs> it's, it's definitely slow a slow roll yeah i the thing honestly that i didn't get into in the beginning getting into death metal was the guitar playing um oh, wow. hmm. i was like well i you know i was as when i was progressing as a guitar player um you know i was getting into a lot of different thrash stuff and I, you know there's a lot of great players out there when you think about bands like forbidden and uh mm-hmm. 
Sanctuary and even, you know, the Metallica and Megadeth stuff, uh, all the other all the other usual suspects. There was a lot of great guitar playing out there. And the first time I heard death metal, I was like, these guys can't really play that good. <laughs> 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 and they, they sound like half ass Slayer to me, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, but that was, uh, and then of course I, I um, acclimated to it and I was, and was digging it more. Uh, and then actually, you know, one of my favorite bands ever is fucking bolt thrower. Yeah, um, nice. And that right there kind of probably shows in my influences because I love double bass through entire albums, like Warmaster. There's double bass through the whole fucking album, pretty much. And I'm just like, that's the evilest, heaviest shit ever. Nice. Uh, so I just, I know, I really dug that kind of mid tempo, kind of churning. Sounds like a tank's rolling over you. You know what I mean? Like, and uh, so I, I, then I started to kind of get it. And I was like, okay, well, the fact that this is a little more broken down and it is a little more primitive than, you know, neoclassical shred that I was getting into at the time, like, you know, Ingve and Paul Gilbert, and, mm-hmm. you know, and some of those guys like the gu- guitar players and Forbidden, you know, they were, they were kind of touching on those levels of playing mm-hmm. back then. I was like, those guys can fucking shred, you know? And the death metal guys, I was like, this guy's can't shred. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. So uh, at the time. And, and the like, same thing with Slayer. I mean, you think about Slayer, it's like, man, the rhythms are incredible. Those leads are fucking terrible. <laughs> I know. I literally like, saw a meme today where it was just talking about that. Just like, whatever, I'll just choose whatever notes I can for a solo and hopefully it works. You know, it's not. You really... hit the dive bomb at the right spot. That's yeah, you got to hit the. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Who were the death metal bands? Who were the first death metal bands that you came across, Dallas? Um, I would say uh, Bolt Thrower. So the, at that Corpse. time, you were comparing them to Forbidden, and you just were like, "This isn't, this isn't good," or you're just like, "These no, guys no, like Bolt Thrower." Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I really dug Bolt Thrower. Uh, I, I heard Bolt Thrower. I heard um, early Cannibal Corpse. I actually the early Cannibal Corpse. I hate to say it. I was just kind of like, oh, what is this? Um, and the, actually, the first Death album. I was the same way. I was like, uh, I'm gonna listen to Slayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, and at that time, it was actually just what I was listening to. Also, I wasn't really listening to a lot of. I was listening to shit like Racer X and fucking Cacophony. Nice. And, um, Jason so I was just like, these guys can't play, you know, every, anytime I'd hear that stuff. But then I started to realize that's kind of not always what it's about. I was yeah. young, you know, I was like in my teens. So it was all about, you know, how badass somebody was. Totally. And, um, but, you know, then I started to get it. I think one of the ones that really kind of won me over and impressed me was, uh, that first Gorguts record. I was like, oh, now that's yeah. some guitar playing right there. Consider and then the first time I heard Immolation, the same thing. I was like, oh, oh, okay. There's some people that can play guitar. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, and then, of course, you know, the Cannibal records just got better and better. And then those guys are badass as fuck now. Um, oh, yeah. And and I, you know, in retrospect, I do like the very early records too. It's, it was groundbreaking stuff. Um but at the time, I was just like, "Yeah." If you're yeah, it's like cacophony, that's going to be an issue. You have Jason Becker and Marty Friedman versus, you know, like a death metal album. You're like, "Fuck, dude, shred harder, dog." <laughs> yeah, and it was, uh, I guess, vocally too was a little weird for me. And one of my earlier bands, I was still trying to do. I wanted to do both. I wanted to do uh, more operatic style stuff, like on the lines of, say, maybe Warl Dane. Mm-hmm. Um, in my early bands, I actually sang like that. I actually used to be like, "Yeah, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice." You still got it? Fuck yeah! Uh, yeah, you know, I probably wouldn't be able to do that for very long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that you, would pass out. Give us a perfect, perfect situation. But um, you know, I'm I still listen to all that kind of stuff too. And uh, but back then, I was going to try and blend like the brutal with the fucking operatic shit. And it was it was. 
it was entertaining. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, Toxic. Uh, you, you know the band Toxic? There's some pretty intense yeah, parts yeah. in there. Yeah, music that's pretty cool. Dudes going for it like that with the falsetto. Yeah, no, that shit's kind of cool, man. And I, I dig the fuck out of it. And uh, that's where I, that's the shit that I grew up listening to. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there has been a few bands that were an exception to the rule moving forward. I think Nevermore was probably a pretty good example of that, where it was the music was heavy as fuck. And, you know, people that were into death metal or into thrash metal or whatever liked Nevermore. Yeah. Because they had really good guitar playing, the riffs were killer, the songwriting was killer, the vocals were killer. You know, they had it all firing on all cylinders. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are there were some cool things that were a little bit in the middle sometimes. And uh, that was probably a good example because Warl would uh, he would also do some more growly stuff every now and then, and it sounded good. And he always had that. He's probably one of my big influences because you can actually hear that he's saying words. And that's what I always tried to do. Instead of it just being what I like to call wheat free vocals. <laughs> wheat free vocals. <laughs> <laughs> <Word. laughs> so uh, your your vocals, uh, you've had a few different vocal styles uh that you've used in Nile and Narcotic. Um, I was trying to come up with words for them like I'd, I'd consider there was like a bark kind of style and then more like a snarl that you kind of settled on. And I was just wondering like how, how you kind of develop those different kind of voices or styles and how they would become utilized. Like how did you pick how to use them and stuff? It really depends on what it's talking about. Um, there was a time in the, I'd say probably early to mid nineties where I was kind of going a little bit more low pitched and also with the earlier Nile records, I was a little more low pitched, but previous to that um, early nineties, when I kind of the guitar playing got too complex and I kind of gave up on the actual singing. um, I did have more of a barky, thrashy, angry, angry sounding. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that I've settled on anything. Um, I would just say that whatever that part needs is what I'm going to try and give it. And it could be a more low or sort of guttural thing, I guess they call it. Or it could just be me pissed off. Um, and the one that's just me pissed off is the one that I like and my bandmates like the most. They're like, when I do that take, they're like, yes, mm. that, that oh. sounds that sounds like you're yelling at me because you're mad at me. That's exactly <laughs> what that's supposed to sound. Like. Um, and, uh, and you know, that that's, I, there's so much terminology and so much stuff involved in doing it. Like uh, I had somebody tell me I had a nice pig squeal one time. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck is that? It's like, I feel like Johnny Lawrence here. You know what I mean? I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> And I, I do not pig squeal, whatever it's like. Wee, wee, wee. No, that's not how I sound. Have you lived in the South? No, I don't think so. Was it a, fi- a I know 15 what a year old fucking sounds you? like? <laughs> so, was it like a fucking 15 year old metalcore kid that told you? Was he wearing kid? his hat backwards no, it and baggy was some, pants? It was some name drop. I mean, she was actually pretty good looking. Yeah, uh, probably wearing a devourment shirt. <laughs> I don't know about that. I didn't pay much attention after that. It's like, yeah, you're like fucking. You're probably 36, and you're 10 years young for me. And then you opened your mouth, and that made the situation even worse. <laughs> so fucking get the fuck out of here. So uh, yeah, you know, I, I was just like, what the fuck ever. We do not do that. Yeah, you don't yeah. Big squeal, motherfucker. So, uh, I, I don't look at what even what I do as like death metal vocals. You know, mm-hmm. I'm just I want it to sound pissed and I want it to be meaningful. And it is me like fucking losing my shit. Mm-hmm. And that's the way it needs to sound. Yeah. It Definitely comes out in therapy, dude. On on the narcotic stuff, especially, it comes out like with a lot of like attitude that really like sells it. And mm-hmm. and that that I think definitely comes across to the listener and so i really like that your, your cool, style which you. is it's it's been so iconic for so long but you're using it now to like i don't know you know just just 
do something new and 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 it took me a little bit to warm up to the narcotic stuff to be honest because i was such a nile fan and obviously there's a change in in topic and by the time i've settled into it i just i'm like 100 percent into it i'm like super down and so i think i, I love the continuity and and sound that has helped kind of change into a different thematic style for me so i love it now it awesome. well thanks man and um yeah you know uh th that was kind of the you know, it was, it is kind of a different animal and I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that you dig it. And, uh, you know, and I knew kind of when we were working, especially on the second record, I was like, you know, they, people may not get this right away, but some of the best albums that were made, you don't get right away. It has to grow on mm -hmm. you a little bit. And, it has to be for it had to grow on for me you a little first. Bit. It has to be for Dallas and the other guys first, you know? Yeah. And, you know, uh, when it comes to Delirium Tremens, uh, one of the songs that I felt like I may be taking a little bit of a risk on was a song called Bleed and Swell. And um, it's kind of a thrashing track. I mean, yeah, it, I was listening to that um, on the way over. I fucking loved that beginning, that really like kind of uh, melodic, uh, kind of like slower beginning. Right. I was actually on the way from a. Uh, Come from my my beer run and um <laughs> I, I had that plan i was like this is my fucking like it's it had an epic feel to it it was very epic you know very yeah i wanted to give myself the challenge i was like okay i want to make something extremely heavy and somewhat melancholic mm -hmm. um and have like a basic fucking rock beat fucking t -t 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 make it big massive like uh uh i hate to use the term arena rock but I wanted totally. something that even if you were in the biggest, washiest stadium ever, it would just fucking rock, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's a, it's an interesting challenge because, you know, it, it, we can uh, – you have to be much more calculating about your note and rhythm decisions at that point because – if you're just flying all over the place, fucking scales in our pages and shit, I mean, that's just instant imp – yeah, yes, that's impressive, you know? But can you make something that's not about that, but still be extremely effective and uh, and connect to the listener on that kind of emotional thing? And the song is basically about dealing with someone that you love dearly, but they are just sort of friendly fire to you in your life because they have like a bad abuse problem with, in this particular case was alcohol. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, that was something that I just needed to get off my chest because I was kind of on my last straw with this person. <laughs> yeah. And um, I just started jamming some stuff. And I think I ended up writing that song in about two days. Oh, wow. When, um, it, when it's something that's that close to, you know, you, that's why it comes out that quick, dude. I There's a, there's a song on our newest album that came to me just as fast for the similar reason and it was basically the same thing you're we're all on a grid the closest points on the grid uh can affect you if you let them they're close for a reason family friends whatever but if they're a, a nuclear point on the grid they're gonna fuck you up unless you cauterize that fucking connection you know and that's yeah. unfortunately in that situation, it sounds like that's what you had to do. Yes, eventually. And uh, despite my own uh, knowing what I need to do and the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm a caring person and, you know, I like to give people second and third chances and I'm not going down with the ship, mm -hmm. but you know, yeah. you, you do, I'm a pretty nice guy. You have to do something pretty serious for me to just eviscerate you from my life. Right. But people do it and they push you to that point mm -hmm. and it go, it comes to a point where it's like, okay, well, if I still allow this person around in my life, I need to start questioning my own yeah. uh, self-worth here. Like yeah. uh, my and own, how it's um, affecting you because uh, like I was just saying yeah. with the nuclear thing, uh, there's radiation involved. That's a slow poison for you. If you don't cauterize that connection, you know, you could give it the second, third, fourth chance, but you're still catching that radiation. So you know? pull me once, 
shame on me or shame on you for me twice you know shame on me kind of thing it's and like you now, get to the point where like yeah. how much of this is really affecting me you know and i need to fucking move on if it, it's not going to change you know yeah man you know i'm a simple dude with simple pleasures and i'm trying to streamline my life not fucking complicate it dude i resonate yeah. so hard with you dallas it's, it's, it's great <laughs> and dude. i hate that some people will put me in the position i mean even if i love them dearly uh they some people have put me in a position where i'm just like you're out i can't do this yeah, you know yeah and, that's what the song was about. And I think a lot of people can relate to that, you know, and I like to keep things sort of simple and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, digestible, if you will. And, and head, especially bangable. When you- head bangable is a big, like, that's another thing that I noticed about all the narcotic shit that I've listened to is like, you make it to where I have to fucking head bang, dude. No, well, joke, thank no you. Joke. dude, I was in my truck head banging to like four songs in a row and i'm like wait i i have to stop i have to turn left here oh no i gotta keep going dude <laughs> especially bleed and swell though that beginning part's like very epic old school like you said arena rock but almost like has some slayer feel to it has some like some fucking where you have to put the your hand up in the air and be like fuck yeah you know yeah, you, you feel dude. it you know it's like i that's exactly what happened to me how that exact song i was like I remember like driving up my hill going like, fuck, I'm going to bring that song up on the podcast tonight. And you just did it for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I think that's uh, as a, you know, as a musician, that's a pretty cool goal to go for is to, you know, kind of get some of the stuff off your chest and then also kind of um, uh, other people are going to get it too. And, yeah, it's that kind it of connection. I mean, that's one accessible. of the things. But yeah, it's not it really ac- necessarily. Yeah, I mean, it's accessible to my ears, no doubt. But I'm just saying, like, obviously, if you were the kid that never listened to any kind of metal before, this would blow your fucking mind apart if it was your first thing you heard. But I'm saying, yeah, I know what you're you want to make it available to a wider and I think that's what I feel from it. Like, I feel like a lot more people, and that's why you got fucking way more followers than Odious does. And you guys got the fucking tours and all that shit because like people want to hear this shit. Well, yes and no. I mean, <laughs> when, when you have a song like Bleed and Swell, um, one of the things that I think mostly in the big picture that that song provided for delirium tremens as a whole was um i see a lot of death metal bands doing this where it's like it's from start to finish it's one color the whole time Mm -hmm. and they do that one thing really good but that's all they do yeah and no matter what kind of band i'm in i don't want to just do one thing for a whole album Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, one of my favorite parts of the live set and one of my favorite parts of that album is when it comes out of Bleed and Swell and directly into the title track, Delirium, which is just a blast beat fucking fest. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. that contrast, you need those peaks and valleys in your album to keep the listener there and to keep me there. I'm, yeah. I don't want to bore myself to death. I want to do different shit. Yeah. And, and that was a prime example. Uh, there's, I can't wait for people to hear some of the new stuff too, because it it, it kind of goes all over the place, even a little bit worse this time. But uh, nice. we've got, you know, it's exciting, dude, because I like extreme all extreme thrashy dude. and even technical stuff on one side, and then on the other other side, you've got this big fat melodic things, you know, ideas and stuff. So it's, I'm I'm excited to hear it, and uh, everybody's contributed some great music to this thing. I'm just, I'm, awesome. I can't wait. And like, yeah, go ahead. can I follow up on that and just ask about the, the upcoming show you've got? And if, if, if there are any more, maybe you can talk about it, but I know you have one in August with contrarian and a couple other bands. Yes, we have, I think it's like three. I think she think my booking agent, Andrea, uh, she works for Ashley talent international. Uh, I think she's going to be trying to maybe go for a, a five show run. I don't know the details 100% yet. And honestly, when I come, when it comes to date, if I don't mark it on my calendar, I don't fucking remember. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, Oh yeah, you got a show tomorrow. Oh fuck. Okay. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of like that. Um, 
but I haven't marked it on my calendar yet, but it's all that shit's in the works. And uh, I know there's already a couple of flyers on uh, that I saw on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, excited about that. And we're going to be just kind of uh, working on the new material uh, a little bit more, just flesh and everything. I mean, it's all there. We've got like plenty of the songs, but it's just like, okay, maybe we can try something different here, or maybe we want to try and add a solo there, or what's this lyric part going to do here? And so we're kind of at that phase, but all the, all the uh, bones are in place, if that makes any sense. Um, and uh, so that's kind of where we're sitting now. So are you going to be debuting new material at the shows do you think well yeah we're already we've already actually been playing uh one new song for a while uh it's called morality and the wasp nice, nice. and it's me basically belting out my hatred for the sort of narcissistic behavior from people and uh and how they're somewhat oblivious to this ridiculous race that they think they're in you know and that's a pretty cool track. Uh, it, and again, it, within that track, it's got a lot of different things going on. You've got crazy over the top blast beats with these really hybrid sounding riffs. And then it breaks down into something more thrashy and punky. And then, and then at the end of the song, it breaks down and goes even a little bit slower for a minute, you know, and that that's, that's the thing. And again, it was one of them songs that I wrote in like a couple of days. Yeah. And then I have songs that have been on these albums that took fucking year to get done. And, and some of those riffs, they may never find light of day. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's funny. It's just, uh, especially the past couple of years, I've just been really adamant. I think everybody's probably come up with a part or a riff or something and then forgotten it and been like, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just don't do that anymore. Um, when I pick up the guitar, I usually just use my smartphone here. I'm like, okay, this is the equivalent of making riff tapes. And I'll just record myself a video of me playing the part. I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. Record <laughs> and do it yep. real quick. And uh, if I ever have an idea too, I got to get it down in my phone. I have to stop what I'm doing. Just even say it into my phone real quick. Cause if I don't, when that feeling of losing the idea even if it was a shitty idea down the road, at least you kind of stretched it out before you realized it was a shitty idea. It's better than losing the idea, you know? Yeah. It was in the, it was the, it was in the bin at least. Um, I'd rather, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a, a gun or a condom. It's better to, you know, <laughs> have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Right. <laughs> Uh, yeah. so that's kind of the philosophy there. And I realized I'm the last track that I wrote, uh, that got all the way together. Uh, it was just a couple of months ago was completed because I did the, that thing. I said, all right, I'm, I'm in the mood. I'm going to just riff out some shit. And I hit the record button on the, on my phone and I riffed it out and all that stuff. And then later on I was like, forgot about it, put it down for like a month, was working on something else. And I came back and I was like, Oh shit, that's awesome. And then, oh, yeah. then I just relearned it or just remembered it and then tracked it into a session, you know, on, on my computer. And then it went into the uh, sort of pool of ideas that you can arrange sort of thing. And then I just worked on it from there. And then uh, again, uh, once I really put my rolled my sleeves up and started working on it, it was a couple of days and I had it. Nice. So actually, I wanted to ask you too because I know we've talked about metal pretty much exclusively on this. Are you? Do you listen to other genres of music? Are you? You know, are you? But I mean, what other genres of music besides metal are you listening to? Like on your own in your car or you know, whenever are you? Are you throwing anything on that's a totally different mix up to kind of, you know, basically give you a break from metal or are you just metal 24 seven? Uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, I listen to a lot of different stuff. I've, I've actually been on a ZZ top binge lately. Nice. Uh, me and my roommate actually just listening to shit like Trey's Ombres and stuff like that. 
nice. just being blown away and amazed by not just the feeling of everything, but just the nasty tones and the guitar playing and uh, the solid drums and bass and just the whole overall vibe. And even Billy Gibbons voice is really cool. Yeah. Uh, so I'd say I, you know, both my parents were hippies. So I grew up a rock and roll already. And mm. um, so I think my heart is just in rock and roll. Uh, all the shit, you know, ZZ Top, uh, anything from that, the damn Stevie Ray Vaughan or even Black Sabbath, Uriah Heep, Deep Purple. I always go back to all those old records, old Rush mm-hmm. and stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, nice. So uh, a big part of my heart is invested in, in those uh, earlier albums. And then also metal. But when I, when I listen to metal, I listen to more thrashy stuff. Okay. Um, I've been spinning uh, Overkill Under the Influence because I think that's one of the best bass tones I've ever heard in my life. Um, stuff like that. Uh, and been listening to, again, I, I like actual vocals too. Mm-hmm. So I've been listening to uh, a lot of sa- old Sanctuary lately. And I've been listening okay. to uh, Sabotage. Me okay. and the roommate have been listening to Sabotage. Uh, and that's pretty old school. And they're just a, one of them killer old school metal bands. And I've been doing any of that. Uh, when I listen to death metal, or I'm in the mood to listen to death metal. Lately, it's been uh, the later Cannibal Corp stuff. Mm-hmm. Including the new one, which is fucking killer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, Immolation and Christian. I love Christian. Yeah. Nice. Um, that's double bass all the way through. Like you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> See, I'm just a sucker for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> I can hear my roommate, and they're playing fucking Sabotage on his guitar now. Nice. <laughs> we just been. Uh, <laughs> Fucking jamming out to the old shit, partying, having a few beers, you know. Nice. Living nice. the fucking single life. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I feel you there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got just, you there. You know, all that shit. Raising hell, hell Satan and all that. Doing podcasts. <laughs> yeah, the Doing podcast. podcasts, you know, hanging out, you know. The podcast has been like, like uh, you know, in the beginning I was like, whatever, I'll, I'll try it and do it and whatever. But it's been like an awesome especially being a, a single man it's been it's my start of my weekend man thursday i have to work tomorrow but you know a lot of people at my job go home early on friday so it's kind of like eh, it's kind of like not really the most serious day so i can have a couple beers get my weekend started then i got friday then i got saturday then i got maybe sunday if i'm feeling it probably Squeeze not one. Squeeze <laughs> yeah, you hear how he said that he was yeah, like yeah. living the single life doing podcast what kind of podcast have you been doing <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, this is this has been like the conduit of, you know, having no shows and and trying to hang out and pretend like I'm at shows. This has been yeah. the perfect the perfect mixture of like sitting at a in in the you know in a bar at a, with a band about to go on, just shooting the shit with some people and you know some old friends and some new friends and 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 just hanging out and just pretending like this shit never happened and and you know just trying to you know basically get prepared for when shit gets back on track which hopefully is going to be here in about another couple weeks and start start you know drinking beers to metal again live it's going to be a weird yeah it's going to be a weird thing i might cry i might cry dude i might cry (laughs) i'm like i don't even know how to go to a show i don't even know how to like hang out at a show i'll be like Like, (laughs) joel just hold my hand dude just hold my hand up i'll even hold your back i'll walk you to the bar dude don't leave straight to the bar All I got to say is that first show and all the practice and preparation that has been going into just me trying to get better as a player and better as a writer and all that. When I walked out on that stage a few weeks ago, I, it was like a scene out of the incredible Hulk. Like, so that's how I felt. I was like, <laughs> all of a sudden, awesome. dude. God, God, God. <laughs> oh. you know, yes. I was like, God yeah. damn it. That's yeah, been way yeah. too long, dude. Waiting oh, too yeah. fucking long. I was like, yeah. shit. Did it just so, come right back oh, to you? Damn, did it come dude. right back or did it, was it just like, was it a learning curve or it just came right back? It came right back. Uh, I did realize that just physically I hadn't done a full on show in a while. God, I was so fucking hungry after that show. I was like, man, I haven't really burned energy like that in a minute. Yeah. And I'm going to work my ass off. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a lazy fucker, but, and 
you know, and I'm glad I'm glad that I did the preparation and I was doing mandatory set list uh, practice just by myself every other day at nice. least. And then sometimes cool. I would do it more on the weekends. But um, I'm fucking glad I did that, man, because I would have been fucked. <laughs> 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 <You know? laughs> I'd have been up there in my hands and you know, I'm trying to play that shit. I've been like. Eh, Just you your know. fucking hands tensing up and your fucking forearms fucking cramping and all that shit. There's nothing you can do about it, and you can hear the picking go. Halftime. I love how Digga is a universal like new. It's a word for all of us to understand. Like if you know exactly what riff you're talking about, dude. The digga digga. Oh yeah. Doesn't matter where you mind. live, dude. If you play death metal, you know, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to know the Zans, too. It's like Zans, dig it, dig it, dig it, dig it, Zans, dig it, dig You know, it's like, hey, man, do you even speak Ripponese? That's what we called it back in the day. We're like, man, Ripponese, bro. It goes like this Zans, dig it, dig it, dig <laughs> that was we we should have known that, that from you that, uh, that would have been useful to have yet last on the with, on the west coast with, yeah with dude, the no mbos guys and <laughs> yeah, yeah. guy and gal yeah because we're more like a, we're more like a jugga 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 gin 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 you're more, more of a yeah zin, but he's zin. got he's yeah. got more of a natural sound dude <laughs> zin, <with> zin. <laughs> yeah rip, rip yeah. and easy dude <laughs> you gotta have the it goes like that, man. Not dig a 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 can I ask you to shout out Joe Howard, your drummer for Narcotic Wasteland, because he helped get you on this podcast, and I wanted to give him a shout out. I'm also helping him out Cheers, doing his dude. EPK. Joe's a sick drummer. Fuck yeah. Cheers. Oh, yeah. yeah, cheers. Joseph is an amazing player, man. He's been an a, a honor and a pleasure to fucking jam with. And me and, me and Chris, um, Ed hasn't made it out to a rehearsal yet, but me and Chris have been jamming with Joe and playing a couple of shows with him. Um for a minute now and he's nailing he's nailing the shit man i mean I, there's you know and he's got a great attitude and a lot of fire and he practices and it shows you know and he's not um a crazy weirdo that tries to kill you um, <laughs> you know he's 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 a good guy you know and we've had a lot of fun and i'm enjoying the chemistry jamming with him and we've we've had a lot of fun man you know the guys come in town and Usually Chris will pick him up from the airport and they come in and we've got a killer isolated place that we can rehearse at um, way out in the fucking woods or we can play as long as we want, as late as we want. And, you know, I'll rent that place out for us for a few days uh, and we just fucking kill it, man. And, and the guy just walked in the very first time and could do it. It wasn't oh, yeah. any, eh, you need to, you know, you need to change this. You know, it wasn't like that. He came in and fucking nailed it. And it just kept getting tighter and tighter and tighter, you know. And uh -huh. I was really happy with the, especially the second show we played on the, the run that we did. And um, the first one went great, too, especially the first one that we've played since, you know, 2019. There mm -hmm. wasn't a perfect show uh, on my behalf. Um, but we definitely did a good job, I thought giving the circumstances and then the second show was like oh yeah d train is in the house bitches <laughs> <laughs> you know that's, uh, so, that's and, so rad and, to hear yeah and uh he yeah. and i went, went on tour together with his older band scalafrea which is how yeah. we met and um he's also playing with fields of elysium right now an awesome more progressive technical death metal band out of uh new mexico that you should all check out but yeah shout out to joseph howard Thanks for uh, bringing, helping, helping us get Dallas today. And uh, hopefully you're going to help us get Leonard from Cephalic Carnage because he also oh, plays with like, Leonard what up? in another band. <laughs> That's you cool. don't need help. Yeah. I'll fucking call Leonard. <laughs> well, fucking do it, dude. I mean, you haven't yet. I haven't seen Leonard <laughs> in, in many, many years. I probably Ooh. haven't seen Leonard since, I don't know, 2005 or 2006. Damn. I haven't, I haven't seen him in a minute, but uh, he did come out to a Nile show. Uh, what tour was that? That was a 
mm, maybe Ithi Phallic or those in the Gaza test, probably the last time I saw him. Mm. Uh, always a super cool guy. I remember uh, doing Milwaukee Metal Fest in 1999 and uh, the relapse stage. They played the relapse, so we were label mates um, yep. at the time. Oh, that's and, right. <laughs> They, they kicked ass that night, and then he threw out in the crowd like this huge pinata joint, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. And threw it out in the crowd, and, uh, and of course, it got ripped to cope and completely. And I think what was in there was like weed and bongs and shit or whatever. So <laughs> the crowd got real quiet for a second. <laughs> and they're like, everybody's just stuffing shit in their pockets, you know? And then all of a sudden the horns go up fucking, yeah! Yeah, dude. Everybody's like, Fuck, that's, that is the badass shit ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. That, that was that was a great show. I was like, holy shit, I can't believe you do. just did that. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. That was yeah. like weed 2000, 2001 or some shit, you know? That Damn. was like, weed was not fucking legal anywhere. He didn't give a fuck. <laughs> That's sick. <laughs> Rocky Mountain Hydro Grind. He knew yep. he had good company around, so he could bust out the big old joint. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cephalic is playing at uh, Psycho Las Vegas that yep. Joel and I are going to be at. So we're cool. going to yep. get to see Cephalic. I've already, uh, I've actually touched base with uh, a couple of them, and we're going to. This is the have first Cali Death podcast on the scene, dude. <laughs> on the you guys scene. are going to be there, dude. <laughs> An actual show that's going to be playing. Yeah, we yeah, might do dude. something. You're gonna have yeah, to that's a, I mean, get some content, dude. Just fuck it, dude. I mean, I you know saw the lineup and I was like, huh, August with like Cannibal Corpse and Emperor and Cephalic and Immolation and all these fucking sick bands. I'm like, dude, I have to go. There's not like a I don't have a a choice. I'm like I'm going. So I just when went. Is it? Just, What's the dates? August twentieth uh, through twenty second. August twentieth. August twentieth. Yeah. I got my fucking time off. Got my hotels. Got my flights. Got my tickets. I'm going I'm there in to October, go, but not. I can't go that early. I'm just. If I'm flights not. are fucking pretty cheap right now, too. Totally, mm-hmm. totally. And if you get mm-hmm. hotels, actually, so this is some. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, are we pulling Dallas from the East Coast? Come on. <laughs> no. So right now, yeah, if man. you want to do it, though, if you, if you go, wanna, I'll go, dude. If you, okay, if okay. we can get Dallas to go right now, I'll buy the tickets, dude. <laughs> Well, not for you, but just for me. I will definitely look <laughs> into it. We, it. The only thing is that we got we got a couple of gigs in oh, August, yeah. so um, I, that doesn't mean that I can't. It just means I'm going to have to further investigate my just overall life shit and see if yeah. I can. Okay, there we go. That. But, but fuck yeah, I would love to go to that. Dude. I want to give everyone forewarning on this though, because uh, a friend of mine, uh, his friend, is running it. And it hasn't been announced yet, but uh, WWE SummerSlam is going to be that same weekend. Mm. And so when they announce that, the fucking that's hotels and flights, way up, everything's so. going to fucking shoot way up. And that's not announced yet, but it, she said it's happening. So Fuck. that's going to be like your hotels will double or triple. So at least whoever's listening, if you want to go to see that, like you have to buy, like, buy it now, like in yeah. the next couple of weeks, you have to get it. Like, cause that, that will completely double everything. And I mean, it's another fucking what, like, 20,000, 30,000 people fights, that are going to be Anytime there? there's a boxing fight, there's a fucking UFC thing going on. As soon as that shit's announced, dude, yeah, that, that whole strip just fucking... Yeah, it's mm. gone. It's yeah. gone. So, just FYI to everyone. If you but don't go, worry. If you go, go to a fucking death metal fucking fest, you, you're all good, dude. If that's the biggest thing going on that weekend, dude, death metal fest, dude. It's yep. going to be cheap oh, yeah. tickets, fucking... Yeah. Nothing to worry about. Stay I want to fucking go now, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of jealous, dude. It's going to be me, Pat, Kenny, and a bunch of other people, and we got hotels and everything. So there's a squad? and uh, Well, you're like the married guy with like 37 kids, so, so like I, I never think that you can <laughs> Maybe pull some strings, dude. I'm like, Anthony can't go, dude. It's all good. So we'll skip it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks, dude. <laughs> no, for sure. It's all good. Well, Dallas, dude, I know it's fucking, you know, it's pushing one o'clock over there in the East Coast. And I definitely am super psyched that you hung out. I don't, I mean, are you, I mean, I'm down to keep going, but I, I feel for you right now because I have to wake up at seven in the morning on the, on Cal, in California. And I'm already kind of like, fuck, I'm going to be kind of fucked up because I've had like six drinks. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm pretty used to it. And well, and tomorrow is Friday. Um, and usually what I'll do is do a little bit of grocery shopping on Friday and then come home and get a shower and crawl into bed for a little while, take a nap. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm actually good for a little bit. What is 107 AM right now? I'm good for maybe a, a little bit while longer, but I am going to have to go use the toilet for a minute. Go for it, dude. Go for it. I will be right, right, right back. Oh yeah. It's all good. Drain that thing. <laughs> I've, already, I've already fucking pissed like four <laughs> times this thing, dude. I know I feel. Don't worry, twice, man. Actually. I won't be. I won't be pulling an Elson in here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't film it, dude. He Don't said, go live. He said pull. <laughs> pull it. <laughs> oh damn. Uh, yeah, should we talk about it while it's gone? good? Hold dude, on. Dude, that's fucking. That's sick, dude. No, that's a uh, yeah. The Psycho Fest is like my number one thing i'm looking forward to right now that's i'm actually nice. joseph you're the reason why you posted that and i was like huh because the lineup was announced but it was like a loose lineup and then they announced like the real lineup and i was like yep. i saw that like within like you know 10 minutes of you posting it and was like what and i just had to my fucking bank account just drained immediately just like, <laughs> like yeah it was like two thousand dollars gone because I, I got two of everything yeah. And nice. I was like, and all of a sudden I was like about to overdraft because I'm like fucking buying all the plane tickets and all the shit. And I'm like, shit, dude, I need to. It's only but, a four dude, hour drive for me. I, I got to apologize uh, to everybody right now. If anybody listens to this now, they're going to hear a small little fucking beeping. And it was my fucking fault, dude. I didn't close my refrigerator door all the way from the last I didn't hear beer. any beeping, dude. I mean, it was, in my, it was in my headphones the whole time. And I was like, uh, I think I don't know about your headphones. On, it was probably just in your. And then actual I finally room. looked over. I could see my. I could see through yeah. there, yeah. and I was like, my fucking refrigerator door didn't close. It was in your door. actual That's ears, good. dude, because you can hear it. We didn't hear it through the mic. All right, it's all good. it wasn't beeping through the mic. So what's everyone drinking tonight? What's uh? We got some time. Perrier what's going on? Lime. Perrier the lime. Fucking... Oh yeah. Yeah. Nice, dude. I got my uh, you know, unofficial sponsor, Artifacts Brewing. Shout <laughs> nice. out to. Same. Christian Same Mansfield. Shit. I'm all, any anytime I'm drinking beer, it's fucking revision and shout social out, fermentation. Shout out to Luca nice. who gave me one of these earlier. Luca, if you're watching, you're definitely watching. What up? Fucking sock on, dude. There's a well, tall there, there is a tall white white claw in there. I, I don't know if I'm gonna get into it, dude. Do the white claws are just the way I mean, because I like to I'm constantly sipping, so claws the law. Uh, actually, you know what's what the, the claws first the law. The first podcast I did with you guys was was with Decrepit, and I did the same amount of drinking, but it was nine percent IPA, and it was mm. like I literally was done. I think I drank probably ten of them in one yeah. podcast because I was like super nervous because I'd never done one of these like you know on video podcast. Mm -hmm. And I looked down and I was just like at the end of the podcast, I was like, "Holy shit, I'm fucking drunk, dude! I gotta <laughs> go to work tomorrow." This is I was like a slop fest. I was. I have to cap it wasted. at a four four pack of pints dude so what would that be that would be like a six pack of beers probably close to it so yeah it's pack of like nice. eight yeah but i've done like totally. eight nine percent ones too on these oh, things man Maybe if anybody's listening to all of these of i've probably got to that point yeah. fucking tell us we're off. talking about the narcotic wasteland or the alcoholic wasteland <laughs> that is this podcast sometimes we kind of <laughs> we uh we start drinking a little too much i, I just can't stop like this it's like i'm it comes from watching sports like after every football play, I take a sip, like whether a good thing or bad thing happened. Isn't I just it? always yeah. am taking a sip. And then before I know it, I'm like, oh, I went through 12 beers. Shit. That's not, <laughs> I don't know if that's healthy or, you know, but they're gone. So. Yeah. Um, I think you guys were talking about what you were drinking while I was in the can. Um, hey, what are you drinking? Uh, I really like Terrapin Hop Secutioners. Oh, mm. nice. Um, if they're from that? Athens, Georgia. It's 7.3 ABV. Here is a empty can of it. Nice. Turn it up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Terrapin. I've, I've heard of that before. Yeah. Is it Grateful just Dead a, has a song. But anyway. So it's just a straight IPA? Pretty much. Um, when you pour it out, is it clear or has it got some haze to it? Um, It's dark but clear. Yeah. Um, there's another one. There's a RJ Rocker's Bell Ringer that's a double. It's a little cloudy. And um, it's one percent more. I think it's like eight point five or something like that. Yeah, um, and it's it's pretty good, but you got to be careful with those. I I remember when I started uh, checking them out, I was like, 
about beer two into it, I was like, man, they need 12 packs of this. And then beer <laughs> four or five into it, I was like, nah, <laughs> they don't need 12 packs of this. God damn. damn. Um, but yeah, I, I dig the hop, hop executioner one. I'm we not were talking, like some beer snob or some weirdo. You can't just, go you know, with the eight percent the whole time with these podcasts. Though. We've we've already I've already had to scale it back on the percentage because it, it it just not sustainable. Oh. Yep, I got a nice four point seven Mexican lager here. That's what keeps me going through the episodes. So yeah, I dig uh, I dig I, for Mexican. I like uh, Tecate. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, dude. But, Tecate Underrated with a, little, with a lime, yeah. Tecate is my favorite one. Uh, yeah. A lot of people say Corona with lime, but I've been to a Mexican restaurant and they bring out. I'm like, give me a Tecate, and they always put the the lime slice on there. Delicious. Yeah. Devour some fish tacos with about Tecates like this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's the fucking life. That's odd. Um, Casey already told told his first Nile live show experience. Um, I wanted to mention mine. I think it was 2006, though it might have been 07, and it was in Hollywood. And I'm from the Bay Area, California, but I I think I like had another reason to be in LA for some reason. But it was like it coincided with Nile, and I was obsessed with Nile as a teenager, and got to go down and see you guys play the House of Blues. And I think on that tour you were with Dath was one of the other bands. I don't remember oh, yeah. the rest of the lineup. That would have been 07. Oh, okay, that's what I was trying to think. Yeah, 07. Um, and I remember you guys, I, I think it was touring uh, Annihilation of the Wicked. Maybe Ify Fallic had come it out was already. Fallic. Ify Fallic had already dropped then. Okay. Um, we were on Ozfest that year. Yeah. And so was Doth, actually. So was that a uh, separate uh, show like um, like like playing Ozfest on tour, but then do, doing separate dates uh, outside of it? Or was that just a separate tour after Ozfest or like before Ozfest? Do you remember that? Yeah, it was, um, it, we would have some, because Ozfest wasn't every day. So we would fill the off day with a show of our own. Okay, so it was an off off day from Ozfest that I got to see you guys. Yeah. Because Ozfest for us was like a twenty-minute Nile commercial, mm-hmm. and then we'd have the off shows where we would do like a headlining thing and like play for an hour, you know, or an hour and fifteen minutes or whatever. Um, and yeah, but yeah, dude, very similar story. Just just as a teenager, just blown away and and just trying to, you know, just trying to get there myself someday, man. Just wanting to do that same thing. It was just so rad. So really that's really, awesome thank you and I'm, yeah. I'm glad that there was something i was a part of that inspired you into music that's uh that's great that's did we talk just, about nile at the pound yet no oh, which I time at the pound <laughs> so, exactly so the pound is kind of a, like a reoccurring thing my favorite time was you guys playing with anthrax outside Oh yeah. yes, fucking yeah. was out. That's the night that I met George I, too. I, I couldn't get in, dude. I fucking didn't buy tickets in time, and we were just like, me and Dan were both like, "Fuck it, dude. We'll we'll go and we'll try and." And they were like, "No, nope, yeah, can't go in." It was one regret. That was wild. Well, just one. I've had actually. Multiple. It was one of the last. <laughs> pound, dude, that was one of the last pound shows before they started getting yeah. shut down. Because uh, yeah, so I mean yeah. I heard like you know rumors about why they closed down, but I think it was something to do with that outdoor stage because you guys played on the outdoor stage, which is so, like yeah. For for everyone listening, explain explain me. <laughs> oh. so sick. Somebody, <laughs> Anthony, explain the whole thing. Well, I mean that that oh, mixture I, that I, mixture I just said I wasn't even there. <laughs> well, there was like this insane out outdoor stage. Well, yeah, yeah. It was never it never had, even had a show at that one. They only had a few shows out there, and Nile Anthrax yeah. was one of them. And yeah, I remember just. That was fucking like I was like, this is the new generation of the pound. This is going to be outdoor, yeah, yeah. having these big festival kind of outdoor stages, it and like it was fast. a cool mix. Yeah. Like watching, you know, Anthrax and and Nile together it was like, yeah, kind of like you know, old school with the new school. I mean, even though you guys have been around, Nile's been around for a while, but still, it's like it definitely had a cool flair to it. You know, like seeing those two bands together because I was like, actually, I was stoked because I was like, cool, Nile's getting on these like bigger tours, playing with these bigger bands, and like I was like getting the recognition that that you know that i wanted them to get and uh 
And uh, yeah, it was definitely, a, that was a life-changing show for sure for me too. Just seeing that shit, that was amazing. That was definitely a highlight for me. Um, we had played the pound indoors a couple of times on the Shrine stores. And then when we came yeah. back through and played again, when Annihilation came out, we were actually on tour with King Diamond. Oh, it wow. was How did that go? From bottom to top, it was Black Dahlia Murder, Behemoth, Nile, and King Diamond. What the? You know, that, that's that's just so crazy. Wait, crazy. And then what happened was our tour merged with the Anthrax tour, and we played the Pound in San Francisco outdoors. Wow. And it was a magical fucking night, man. Let me tell you, we Jesus, when we were playing the song Annihilation of the Wicked, me and Carl looked up and saw the moon and the clouds and shit in the sky. Wow. And it was just Fuck yeah. fucking bad, dude. Wow. It was badass. Sick. That's one so of those sick. it was killer and then uh king he fucking he was in full form that night with cigarettes oh, yeah. and hot coffee he was kicking ass and um <laughs> and uh and anthrax ever the whole show was just fucking stellar and it was a fun night it was one of those ones i'm like and then i heard the pound closed down and i was like fuck me yeah. man and it's then we ended up playing uh slims for quite a few years and slims yep. was cool too which unfortunately is gone now too yeah yep. yep just closed during the pandemic yeah mm -hmm. i mean they were they were definitely talking about closing i guess beforehand and like it's the still just kicked it into four it's like, one of those rips that you're just like fuck dude so many good times at that venue and so know? many venues have closed recently man i hope there's like a resurgence of these entrepreneurial can't get the word out kind of uh <laughs> no, i think you did pretty good with it dude that, uh, yeah, that are gonna open some new venues and get some more places to jam because a lot of iconic ones have closed in the last year and it's pretty it's pretty hard to pretty hard news to take you know all across the country yeah i'm trying to think of the place that narcotic played uh a few years later it was not in san francisco it was north of san francisco metro the metro it was a small club. It was very small, but it was an awesome show. It was a good little bit of people there. I think any, I saw that you played. Social club? I think you played the Red House in Walnut Creek or something. Yeah, that's that sounds familiar. I just had the flyer up of the tour. I was going to say North would be Santa Rosa. There's some clubs. Oh, Petaluma. Was it like a skate Petaluma. park? A skate no. No, no, no. Now, this okay. place was in a strip mall, kind of, and um, mm -hmm. there was like a killer oh. Mexican restaurant close to it. Uh, the Red Hat in Concord, it looks like you played Concord. Concord that's yeah. it. Yeah. That okay. was yeah. nice. Right on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was a pretty decent turnout for that show. I think uh, the one, at least one of the local bands had a pretty good pull at that show, which was killer. And, uh, and that was a wild night. I won't go into details. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, dude? Just divulge whatever you'll give us. I don't know. It was one of those uh, nights where I got lucky after the show. <laughs> nice. Oh, there you nice. go. Oh, yeah. And I was like, damn, shit, I didn't see that coming. But when you do. <laughs> <laughs> He's single, ladies. Just letting you guys know. Next tour. Yeah. Dallas is looking for love in all the right places. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not looking for that kind of trouble. <laughs> no, no, I want to end up, end up on the internet and my bandmates get <laughs> thumped at me. <laughs> like, God damn it. Dallas, no phones dude. involved, dude. I know back in my touring days, it was flip phones, so I couldn't feel myself <laughs> doing stuff. <laughs> to... <laughs> well, you'll laugh at me. I had a flip phone uh until about uh three months ago oh damn yeah I, I, I thought tablet. you were about to say three I years used my, i used my tablet for whatever online shit i need to do or the like i was take i was teaching and taking lessons there for a while um so i was using it for that and it was a useful tool but then and finally um the battery took a shit in it and then um and then my flip phone that was just for texting and actual phone calls if somebody needed me. I was like, I don't need this shit. So now I've got a smartphone like every other jerk off. Hallelujah. <laughs> Not so texting with the flip phone, how was that? So minimal, minimal detail. Oh yeah. Well, I was response. pretty quick with it and I could do it without yeah. really looking at it. Yeah. That's oh, the okay. thing about the flip phone is like you got the two dots in the middle. And so I back when I was like I You already lost me, dude. 
No, I could. There's two dots like in the middle of the numbers, and I could just I could I'm drive joking. and text people without even looking. I would just be holding my phone and like not even worried so, about like, like texting like, by braille, basically. Pretty much, if you got the middle down, you know we're like one, two, three. You know, one, two, three is above you, and and seven, eight, nine is below you. It's like you can figure it out. It's like. I, and when they came out with those like these touch screens, I'm like and almost getting in wrecks trying to respond to people and shit. Like <laughs> it's supposed to be like more proficient, but it's actually more dangerous. Uh, that- so you're one of them texting and driving dicks. <laughs> I'm good at it. No, I do voice. I do voice text. I do I'm voice good text at it. Now. I'm good at it. I almost no, got into several. The only kind of, but I'm only, good at it. The only time I ever really sign language just specially <laughs> for people like you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I've never. I'm knocking on wood right now. I've never gotten a ticket in my life. Who that doesn't? Why is that? I've, why is that an argument? Because I've driven right from fucking coast to coast like a thousand times, and I've driven okay. all the time. From, and <laughs> I. I've driven drunk. I'm just kidding. I haven't. Um, I uh, no, no, when I was a kid. Right. Um, but uh, when no, I was no. A kid. <laughs> no, now it's voice text. Now I, my phone connects to my little thing, and I just go like, "Bam!" Totally. Tell them, you suck. I hate you. And eat my farts. Which works. Totally works when you're driving. You could do that hands free. You yeah. got Siri in your ear now, like that fucking movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix. She's in there, dude. She's in your ear. Hey Siri, call blah blah blah. Hey Siri, text blah blah blah. I do, I do kind of like that because I don't want to look at my phone because the phone's kind of like a dude. A, she a, hears me right now. <laughs> <laughs> dude, fuck. That's a little creepy, but that is creepy. I mean, I don't know if Siri wants to listen to me. It's fine, dude. I'm just like, like I have Alexa in my bathroom. I'm like, if you want to listen to me, take a shit. That's fine. That's if you want a government spy on me, like farting a bunch and having <laughs> diarrhea. That's um, that's on you. If you so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So you want right, to? So can we? Can we? Here. Can we get? I I have a fan yes. question. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Joseph. Yeah. So so this is from from someone commenting on um on Instagram. So everyone who submits questions, thank you. We love getting to read the questions. And this was oh, yeah. this is one I I hope you're cool with with ta- tackling Dallas. It's uh. What's your favorite Nile album? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, when it really comes down to it, it, it would be a close tie between those whom the gods detest and Annihilation of the Wicked. Um, it depends on my mood. But actually, uh, What Should Not Be Unearthed had similar things to it. Um, I don't know. It would be easier for me to tell you my least favorite. Oh, actually, I <laughs> want to hear see, that. I want to hear that. Yeah, that would definitely be at the gate of Seth. There, that's my least favorite Nile album. Um, yeah, the songs are killer. It just uh, as a as, as a sum of its all parts, it just didn't hold the weight. I felt that those in the gods attested, or the one after it, which was unearthed. Mm-hmm. I think that those albums were kind of. We were kind of back from mm. that kind of uh, thing that we were doing in Annihilation, um, but essentially, you know, on on paper, I would say Annihilation. Uh, my heart tells me those whom the gods detest. Interesting, because that's a fucking album right there. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. Uh. So just just to say my piece and wrapping up, um, playing along to Nile on guitar and drums was one of the things that helped helped me become a death metal musician. And um, I'm, I'm not saying this to self-promote because I don't actually want anyone to watch it, but I just inspired by Alex Rudinger's posting the Lash to the Slave Stick drum playthrough. I just did my own. I only have an eye, uh, a, a camera quality audio on it, so it's not sounding that good. But I just like had to play through it because that was like the song that like I learned how to play double bass to. Um, and I know you contributed uh, most of the guitars to to that song, so I was just like, and it's so cool that you re-recorded them for 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 Rudy, and that he used your new tracks to create his playthrough, and that was just a rad spotlight for for that song and for you guys. And uh, so yeah, dude, just massive shout out and Annihilation changed my life, and it's all been amazing ever since, man. So thank you so <laughs> much, Dallas. Thanks a lot, man. Uh, that was a very fun album to put together. It was we had done shrines and a lot of people say that that's their favorite album. And I definitely understand why. I mean, we, we were definitely felt that we were 
on the crest of a wave of something. And we just kept riding it and seeing it where it would take us, you know, and uh, Annihilation, again, kind of getting back what I was saying about putting a good album together. That thing's got peaks and valleys all over the place. It's got some of the most insane speeds and craziness, but also knows how to breathe and it knows how to break down. And Mm -hmm. we, you know, that's one of the things that I've always enjoyed about the Nile music is, um, it is challenging and technical and fast sometimes, but we also know how to break it down, but not in the normal. We did it our way. Yeah, where yeah. we just get slow and crunchy. The riff will be slow. The riff will be like, or something like that. And the bass drums, it's a slow beat too. Da, 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 da. God, but the bass drums are going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? And it just, yeah. um, that that was a thing with the Annihilation yeah. too, that it kind of changed some stuff. We, we touched on that a little bit on some of the early records, but that was a new thing with, that was a new sound yeah. for us. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah, fucking flying double bass, but slow drum beat and slow riff. And it's oh. like, oh, the power and the weight behind that. It's like, yes. Oh, you guys make you make that nasty bass that album. That, that, you get that nasty bass <laughs> oh, yeah. listening to it like, ugh. Man, that came yeah, out, yeah. We, we were all just <laughs> like, dude, so gnarly, dude. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah, it was nasty stuff. I mean, it, it was a, like I said, it was a, a, a fun. It was a joy to work on because we were really on fire. You know, when we went in and yeah. uh, and to I be fans that from you know Black Seeds and even previous to follow like to go through it with you guys and then get to that and like it's like it's something that's hypnotic at times. Hypnotic is a good word for some later Nile riffage where you're just like, "Mm." yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's got to, you know, at the end of the day, it's got to have the groove. It's got to have the hook, but it's also got to have, um, well, memorabilia is nice, but also it's got to get generate those, those feelings. And if you're reading along with it and reading the lyrics and you're listening to it, it's got to paint sort of a a image in your mind. Kind of like if you're reading a good book, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, ah, the movie sucks because you've already, you know, yeah, that's what's that's cool it. about music and the lyrical content that you're trying to do. It's like you paint an image. You're, you are you're painting your this imagery, yeah. Beautiful, shiny monument somewhere out in the desert. Or you can paint um, a really dingy looking street with trash everywhere and people walking mm-hmm. around all fucked up. I mean, the, totally. these are the things that you can do with music. And, and that's one of the things that kind of connects us all together. Um, and there's so much that you can do with it. Uh, uh, there are definitely a lot of people out there beating a dead horse. Um, but there's, I think there's a new, there's going to be something new on the horizon very soon. And it's going to be, sort of all encompassing, whether it be history or current life experience, there's something happening. There's a lot of new killer talent rising right now. Definitely. (coughs) Stuff's bubbling up. Stuff is definitely bubbling up. And, you know, with what we've had for the last year and a half, it's like people have been able to hunker down and really focus on those things if they really decided to for the last year and a half. And that's where the explosion is going to happen is we're starting to see tons of creativity blasted out, you know, when everybody's finally ready with what they did during the pandemic, like, yeah, there's going to be some really cool stuff coming very soon. It's that, that young generation too. It's just like, yeah, you know, they've, they've started like, you know, Dallas started with, you know, your earlier bands that you were like listening to a bunch and, forbidden and all that stuff and now they're starting with like annihilation of the wickets their first album they get into and then they're pushing it their bar starts their timeline starts there for where they get into music that's like where you're talking about cannibal corpse or or listening to cacophony or whatever they're starting with like annihilate like some like you know a nile album from like 2010 or something you know they're 
that's where their like journey starts and then they're just going to keep progressing and it's going to get crazier with new ideas with new new things to throw in there and it's just going to keep getting crazier and crazier yeah yeah and and hopefully uh as long as everybody doesn't lose sight of the op- optimal goal and as long as you know people don't take themselves too seriously because at the end of the day we are in the entertainment business mm-hmm. totally now Definitely. because we're in the entertainment business you're not going to see me you know put on makeup or leather or anything <laughs> like that because that's not what yeah. i'm trying to do i'm not mm-hmm. saying anything good or bad about that if that's what you're trying to do with your entertainment then go for it Definitely. um and i there i think that's something that a lot of people tend to forget sometimes too is that this is the entertainment and in this industry. type of music we decide to f- express through the music specifically i mean it's a running yeah. joke but i wear sandals on stage so it's like i don't give a <laughs> oh fuck. buddy i've mm-hmm. got a t-shirt that you would love <laughs> let's, let's it's actually with- got jesus on the crucifix right okay <laughs> And it says, <laughs> men who wear sandals get what they deserve. Oh. <laughs> and I've gotten everything that I deserve. Fucking yeah. oh, fucking Hey, did you know the CDC, said fucking... was, hey, the CDC said it was okay for you to stop wearing socks with those sandals? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm good now. I can take my Kirkland socks off, put my reef sandals back on. You really trust I'm going, the CDC, I'm going to raw though? dog my sandals, dude. I can yeah. finally raw dog my sandals again. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> you want oh, foot man. Ah, man. Comfort <laughs> is is key, especially when you get exactly. older. Shit. When I'm hanging around at the house most of the time, I'm chilling in fucking swimming trunks. <laughs> oh. There you go. That's what yeah, I'm doing right free now. Free ball it, free ball it, dude. In, in the shorts. <laughs> we call them yeah, board yeah, yeah. shorts, dude. Free board ball shorts. it in the board shorts, dude. Yep. Let them fly. That's free. it, man. No doubt. Well, should we wrap it we up? We should. Yeah. All right. On that bombshell. <laughs> I know. I mean, I shouldn't have said it like that. Like, I mean, we've, uh, we've been going hard and we got the <laughs> somewhat yeah. warning at 107 a, bu- a bunch of time ago. I don't even know how long ago that was. How about time? It's like 134 one- now. It's been 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, it's 134. Oh, okay. That's actually a perfect time to uh, to wrap it up. Fuck cool, yeah. dude. Yeah. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much, dude. Yeah, thanks, it's Dallas, for coming on, dude. Cool, I really appreciate dude. it, man. You're a huge influence for all of us and it's fucking cool to get you on here and get your perspective oh, dude, on stuff. I'm respect. super stoked that you came on here, yeah. dude. Thanks a lot, man. The pleasure is mine. And uh, you gentlemen have a wonderful evening. And uh, shit, man, hit me up sometime. You know, we can shoot the shit. Dude, if this, you ever come yeah, to cool. the area or anything, you got a place to stay here. You're always welcome to come the... back on here, too, dude. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. That and you like made us plan. really excited for that new narcotic shit. No doubt. Yeah. Dude, I want Everyone to should listen to new, new narcotic and watch their fucking live shows and Go hang out with them live. No doubt, dude. And talk about Dallas's pig squeals and, and just hang out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally, man. Wearing devourment shirts and yeah. I'm completely <laughs> vegan, man. I'm getting that wheat free thing down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That would be meat free. Uh, meat free. Right meat on. Free. All right. Well, cool. Thanks so much for sticking around with us. Fucking Cali Death Podcast. Thank you to the subscribers, notifications, push all those buttons and help us out with the subscriptions if you haven't already. Uh, Narcotic Wasteland, hit them up on all the social medias, buy t-shirts, buy CDs. Really fucking support underground music because these guys are doing some sick shit. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next week. We'll definitely be here next Thursday. Live or not, we'll still be here uh, Friday next week right on guys <laughs> cali death podcast love you guys <laughs> hit us up oh yeah dude you all have a good evening right on. you too bro right on <laughs>